you don't have to experience pain and hunger to get the benefits of fasting. It's self-inflicted suffering that you didn't need to do. I was basically eating boiled chicken breasts and steamed broccoli all day, every day. And finally, my wife and my business partners pulled me aside and said, dude, you no longer have a personality. Aging is death by a thousand cuts. I've always thought of fasting as you put nothing in your mouth that isn't exactly H2O. This is about more energy and it's about more clarity and less time wasted. Give me some rapid fire things that are gonna help me be superhuman. Why is it problematic though to go all in? Like when I think about autophagy and the cells cleaning themselves up and knowing that that gets kickstarted by just not eating, why is it problematic to go too hard on a fast? Well, there's a name for overfasting. It's called starvation and malnutrition. <laughs> So there's that. Now, do you do you bracket that only by time, though? So is that like if I was going to do a three day fast, um, I would think that your advice would be go all in. But obviously, having read the book, I know you have a different punchline. So um, is is it that it becomes problematic as you get into the 7, 10, 21 day range? Or do you think that that's actually suboptimal from the jump? You know, I'm totally happy to do a three-day fast, four-day, five-day, seven-day, 10-day, although when you get to 10 and beyond, you probably want to be very experienced or have some medical um, oversight because your electrolytes are likely to get out of whack. And frankly, your ability to really detect what's going on in your body isn't very good. Like you're kind of loopy after 10 days of fasting. You, you have like clarity, but you're also ungrounded. If, and you're talking water-only fasting. Um, even if you're having tea and coffee, and water-only fasting is basically a, a form of self-flagellation. I call that hair shirt fasting. Hair uh, shirt? Hair, hair shirt. So um, monks used to, because they were such sinners, they would make shirts out of human hair that were super itchy, and then they'd wear them all day so the itchiness would remind them of how bad they were. In other words, it's self-inflicted suffering that you didn't need to do. Uh, so it's okay. Most Everyone has herbal tea in every spiritual tradition ever, or just black tea or green tea. Um, so the fact that mice did water fasting, it's cause they didn't have anything else. They're mice. <laughs> so water only fasting is for, uh, perfectionists, kind of purists. You don't have to do that to get the benefits. In fact, you'll probably get more if you have some polyphenols during your fast. All right. So let's define some terms here. So I've always thought of fasting as you put nothing in your mouth that isn't exactly H2O that anything beyond maybe I recently broadened my stance to include salt just normal table that's salt. That's pretty important. I was going to do a 10 day fast without salt. You that's die. It. There's that. <laughs> so okay. walk us through then. So if we've got, okay, at water only becomes problematic roughly around 10 days. And I'll say that that seems slightly controversial. I've heard people say that you can go farther with supervision. Um, but broaden my notion of what a fast is. The definition of fasting is simply to go without. And you can fast from many things. You can fast from masturbation. You can fast from porn. You can fast from alcohol. Right? You can fast from junk food. It's called eating healthier. You can fast from carbs. It's called the keto diet. You can fast from animal products, even though it's a bad idea, for long periods of time. It's called the vegan diet. And there's all sorts of things. Uh, so fasting literally means to go without for a set period of time. And all of those things can make you stronger. And a lot of people mix up the metabolic and the cognitive and the health benefits of fasting with the self-control benefits. And they try to mix them up. And the truth of the matter is that you and I are pretty fortunate. You know, we've had companies that have done well. And we don't have to worry about getting up, driving for an hour in traffic. Our kids are or now staying at home with, you know, two kids hanging off each arm uh, and just a huge amount of chaos. Oh, and on top of that, I'm just going to fast today even though I'm metabolically not really in good shape. And what's going to happen is you'll be just like me when I weigh 300 pounds. You're going to be hypoglybitchy. You're going to be hangry. You're going <laughs> to yell at your kids. You're going to yell at your boss. And it's not going to be a good day. And you're going to say basically F fasting. This is stupid. It doesn't work. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to experience pain and hunger to get the benefits of fasting and to go into fasting. And after 10 plus years of recommending this in my, my writing – and 15 years of practicing this, what you find out is that there are things that you can do in literature that don't trigger the two things that break a fast. What breaks a fast is having sugar or carbohydrate that raises your insulin. So if you keep insulin low and your blood glucose won't change much except for based on your adrenal, uh, adrenal function, um, if you do that and you don't eat protein, which impacts a whole different set of enzymes, you're getting the benefits of fasting. 
And now some people are already up in arms going, you can't have 5,000 calories of fat. No, you would get disaster pants if you did that. But you can have small amounts of this. And the evidence I have for this is called, number one, bulletproof protein fasting, which has been practiced since 2012 when I wrote about it. And this is, you eat less than 15 grams of protein during a day, but you eat carbs and you eat fat and magically autophagy turns on in studies you can do that so i think we're gonna have to we're gonna have to define then what the biological markers are that we're um bracketing fasting with so if the loosest definition of fasting is going without but now we as we get into sort of metabolic fasting or dietary fasting there's certain parameters that we're looking for so um, i've heard people define it as you started that you break a fast with anything that raises your insulin. And should you take in something that doesn't raise your insulin, then you have not broken your fast. And so I'm just curious is one, why do people use insulin as the marker? Is insulin the only marker of a fast? Or if, it, if you're not in autophagy, it's technically not a fast. Like what are the, the parameters by which you say this still qualifies as a fast? It depends on your goals and the type of fast you're looking for. Right. So some people fast for uh, healing the gut. Right. And during that kind of a fast, you might want to have just water. You probably want to have water plus these colored compounds in tea or coffee because those feed good bacteria. They're a prebiotic. You might also use one of the three fasting hacks that just turn off the pain of fasting for people who just needed to get through the day and fast and get healthier along the way is prebiotic fiber. So you can do that. And what does prebiotic fiber get rid of symptomatically? Headaches, hunger? Prebiotic fiber feeds the bacteria in your gut so they make less lipopolysaccharide, which is a major issue during fasting. It also makes sure that you don't starve the gut bacteria. And when you do that, you turn off hunger. And there's multiple studies that show that the soluble fiber that cannot be digested by you, um, that it helps support good gut bacteria. So now you're fasting. You're not dealing with a, a large amount of lipopolysaccharides, which are bacterial toxins they make when they're stressed in the gut. So then you're like, oh, wait a minute. I had healthier gut bacteria. My blood sugar didn't change, but the gut bacteria converted this fiber into butyric acid or butyrate, which is a ketogenic compound. So all of a sudden, wow, I didn't experience hunger this morning. Wasn't that great? I didn't spend half my morning thinking about muffins and barely make it through the day, and I still got my fast in. And, and this idea that you have to feel pain and suffering and just like muscle through it, it doesn't work for people who have a lot going on. In fact, it makes it much harder. I don't believe in causing suffering unless there's a hormetic effect and there's no other way to do it. Okay, so let's talk about the goal of a fast. So um, one, so you just talked about healing a gut. So yep. there we might have different outcomes that we're looking for. Basically, you'd be resting the gut. You even say in the book, if you have a gut problem, you're trying to heal it. The easiest way to heal it is to not have anything in the gut. Yep. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. So we're not necessarily worried about insulin going up, down or indifferent. We're not necessarily worried about even calories being present. We're worried about having things for the bacteria in your gut to have to work on so that they can just take a break and sort of hit the reset button. Now, if I'm doing a, a fast where my specific goal is to get into autophagy, what can we intake and still have autophagy being present? Like, can I have uh, fat in my diet and stay in autophagy or yep. what does that look like? You can have moderate amounts of fat in your diet and still stay in autophagy. But in the research that I did and in um, the conversations with other experts, it's apparent that having only fat isn't going to affect autophagy. Now, if you have 3,000 calories of fat, a caloric excess can inhibit autophagy, but no one's ever studied what a fat-only caloric excess looks like because no one would actually do that. So there's also a lot of things like the fasting mimicking diet that turn on autophagy even though you're eating some stuff. And what elements of the fast are they mimicking? Um, well, it's a very low calories for five days, about 500 calories or so um, for uh, five days. And this is based on research from Walter Longo, who's what I'd call him the godfather of fasting and one of the, the top fasting experts out there today. So they're saying, hmm, we're turning on autophagy even though we're eating some stuff. So you can't even say protein without saying which proteins. There's some proteins you can't even digest and maybe those wouldn't affect it. So it, it gets very specific around some amino acids raise insulin a lot more. So is 
you know, a few teaspoons of whey protein going to break a fast more than collagen? Probably, but it depends on your individual response to those. Ideally, though, less than 15 grams of protein from all sources is going to maintain your state of autophagy. Uh, and this goes back to like my first big book in 2014, and that data was out there and based on studies. So the deal is just have no protein and have no sugar and no carbs you can digest and the fasting processes will work. There's one little asterisk to that statement and we're getting relatively technical. Um, one of the things that happens when you fast is there's something called FIAF. It's fasting induced adipose factor and your liver turns this on and says, oh, I'm fasting. Um, there's no calories, I better use this. And what does it accelerates fat burning? And when you're not fasting, it accelerates fat storage. Unfortunately, if you have a lot of bad gut bacteria, they're like, oh, this Petri dish is our Petri dish, so we're gonna hack it. And the bacteria themselves will make more fasting-induced adipose factor than your liver would naturally, which means that you lose weight faster when you're fasting, but you gain weight faster when you're eating. And this Why is a would question- they do that? Um, because they want to make sure that their Petri dish doesn't starve. And also I, as a little bacteria, I don't have any food. Let me tell the Petri dish to secrete more energy so it can go find food and then I'll get food. I see. So they're literally changing your behavior. And it, it's fascinating that they do this, but you can also manipulate them knowing that they do this. And so fasting can help you lose weight. But if you have good gut bacteria present and you're aware of that fact, you can do things like consume that tea, those polyphenols, that feeds good bacteria called the Bacteriodetes family. So the colored compounds and fruits and vegetables and coffee and tea and chocolate um, are all prebiotics for good gut bacteria that you cannot buy in a probiotic. And so having healthy gut bacteria resolves that problem. And, and the, the reality is that you and I are, from the perspective of our mitochondria, which are the things we're working on mostly, in fact, most of my work is around mitochondria. These are ancient bacteria embedded in our body. They think they're in charge, and they're the ones driving your hunger, your fear, your cravings. Uh, they're the, the ones that make you you know, date people you shouldn't be dating, and, and they, they drive human desire. In fact, there's an order of operations from them that I describe in the book, and this is the algorithm for all life forms. And so they're messing with you. And then you have gut bacteria that are also messing with you by secreting their own factors to try and get your body to do what they want you to do. And then poor us, we're also in there in our, our logical cognitive brains going, wait a minute, I'm getting pulled all over the place by these urges, right? And then eventually when your energy is lower and your urges are high, your ability to manage your emotions goes down, your ability to make good decisions goes down, and then you eat the cookie. And that's the annoying thing. What is up, my friend? You and I are living in a golden era of self-improvement. We have books, platforms like YouTube, courses, seminars, virtual events, workshops. The list really is endless. The internet has been so good for people like you and me who want to accomplish greater and greater things in life. And now, my friend, it is about to get even better. I've been spending most of this year working on the single most entertaining tool that you're ever going to have around self-improvement, and it is called Project Kaizen. It's a web three based game experience that will be unlike anything else you've ever engaged with in your life, partly because the technology is new and it's amazing. If you're not familiar with blockchain, NFTs and all of that, Kaizen is going to be the perfect introduction for you as it is an excellent intersection of entertainment and learning all backed by the blockchain. We're getting closer and closer to launching this project for you every single day. We are working our faces to the bone to get this thing out there. And my friend, I want you to experience it. So click the link on your screen and head on over to my Discord channel to stay up to date and be one of the first to join me inside of Project Kaizen, which by the way, gets its name from the Japanese term of never ending improvement. All right, back to today's episode. So when I think about um, all of this stuff sort of working in concert, this big cacophony of things happening. You've got the mitochondria pulling you in one direction. You've got the bacteria in your gut pulling you in another. You have your own body's response to um, lack of food. We've got autophagy. That's working for us. Mm -hmm. We're cleaning up the cells. So I could see how that would speak to longevity, maybe even clarity. But other than autophagy, what are some of the reasons that fasting is so important for people? The number one reason isn't autophagy. That's actually kind of a, a nerd reason for fasting. And I say that happily being a nerd. 
Um, most people who are practicing intermittent fasting today don't even know what autophagy is, and that's okay. What they know is that they fast and they get energy, right? And and it's a lot of energy because even if we're eating you know a so-called healthy diet, um, according to the the bulletproof stuff the first chapter of the book, there's five classes of toxins made by mother nature that we're eating every day, right? And um, the first one, uh, I think there's the first big book about it was lectins. Not all lectins are bad, but these are defense molecules for certain types of foods like grains and bell peppers and things like that. And they make you really hungry and they mess with you, right? And then you look at things like phytic acids that inhibit your ability to absorb minerals. There goes your argument for a whole grain kind of thing because they're full of these things that stop you from having zinc. There's a problem there. And then we have histamine, which forms in certain foods when they sit around that gives you just severe cravings. And then you have oxalic acid, which is kale and chard and raw spinach, which I've been warning about for years. And then the fifth one is mycotoxins that grow on food in the field and while it's stored. And all of those will mess with you. And when you fast, you get none of those. So you're like, wow, I feel so good. And it's not the fasting, it's that you're not eating stuff that makes you feel bad that you're used to eating every day. So that's a, a hidden side benefit of fasting. Yeah, so getting into like inflammation and things like that and fasting having such a profound impact on that, what I wanna know, when we start fasting and we're having the our energy levels are going up because we're not intaking a bunch of things that you know whether it's just bad food or whether it's the toxins you're talking about um we also are getting this lowering of inflammation one i'm curious what's causing the lowering of inflammation is it simply the absence of the toxins that you mentioned or is there more to it there's two big things going on. One is the absence of toxins. The other one is that ketones themselves are anti-inflammatory, profoundly anti-inflammatory. So now you're saying, wait a minute, uh, I'm having less inflammation because uh, and if I had to guess, I'm gonna say it's probably two thirds caused by not eating stuff that makes you weak and one third caused by the presence of ketones, um, the inflammatory things. I could be wrong, but that's you know a, a very rough estimate of why. And if you were to say, I'm going to go on a super clean, no plant toxin kind of diet, you feel pretty similar, but you're still going to have blood sugar swings that you don't get when you're fasting. They generally, after a little while, it stabilizes. Okay. So we've got fasting playing this insane role. When, when we're talking about metabolic diseases, which mm -hmm. I mean, depending on who you talk to is everything from cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, like there must be some common thing that this all has working together. So is it insulin? People have referred to Alzheimer's as type three, uh, diabetes type three of the brain. Um, is it just inflammation in general from the ketone bodies? Like what, what is it that is operating across all these different, um, disease manifestations? What's going on there is you're getting a metabolic reset and you're getting a lot of autophagy. You're taking the, the mitochondria that are weak, They've learned, and there's a quadrillion of them, way more than there are cells in your body, and they've learned, eh, there's lots of food coming. I don't really have to do anything. It's okay if I'm running at 50% you know, efficiency. It's good enough for the world I'm in. And then suddenly, like, I'm in a world where I have to be able to really be on my toes. The body looks around and says, well, this sucks. I guess I'm going to have to kick out all the weak mitochondria and go to the expensive process of building fresh new ones that are young. And those are the mitochondria that can effectively and efficiently use glucose or ketones. And that's what's causing a lot of this. It's removal of senescent cells. But even then, if you were to take a water fast and you were to say, hey, I'm going to do 500 milligrams of fisetin and two grams of quercetin, which are massive senolytic promoters, you're going to get more out of it. But now you're not on a water only fast. You're using supplements in a targeted way uh, to improve autophagy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe that the the puritanical approach of just water isn't advisable, but I do think if you're gonna do stuff during a fast, it's gotta be limited and you've gotta know what it is and why you're taking it. For instance, there's other supplements that I recommend in Fast This Way that improve the body's ability to do what it does during fasting. I'm talking about proteolytic enzymes, things like seropeptase and natokinase. And what these do is they help the body to break down waste proteins and scar tissue. So since the body's already working on that and you give it more of the enzymes it needs, that means your pancreas and to a certain extent your liver 
can make the enzymes that they need to make for repairing DNA and refolding proteins and things like that because some of the cleanup proteins you've already taken orally. Uh, you can also take uh, things like activated charcoal during a fast. And because your gut bacteria get really stressed and they make more of that lipopolysaccharide or LPS we talked about earlier, if you bind that in the gut, you actually have less inflammation, but you feel a lot better. So the, the water only thing is like, I'm just going to put my head down and go through it. I just don't believe in extra suffering. I would say anyone on a water fast who adds activated charcoal is going to have better results 100% of the time. Because it's blocking the toxins from coming yeah. out into the body. I know in the book you said that part of the keto flu that people experience when they're beginning fasting or beginning a keto diet is mitigated mm -hmm. by taking activated charcoal for that reason. It's interesting. Yes. I wish I had known that the first time that I did keto, which I had brutal keto flu. It was yeah. god awful. Um, what are some of the other, because you give many different styles of fasting um, and ways to mitigate some of the, the difficulties that people can have with fasting. So what are some of the other things that we need to address and how do we address them? One of the biggest concerns there is, is people are saying fasting makes me feel good, so I'm going to just do it every day. And they go, you know what? I'm going to try this new OMAD thing where I only eat dinner, right? And like, oh, I'll do that every day for a week or so. Oh, this is awesome. For those Maybe that have I'll never fast. heard of that, one meal a day, OMAD. Yeah. So OMAD is one meal a day, and they're saying, okay, um, that's that's great, and OMAD is really easy. You skip breakfast, skip lunch, have dinner. There, you just did a 24-hour fast. And it's not as sexy as it sounds, like, I'm OMAD, I'm I'm keto, I'm strong. It, it's literally, you skip two meals, uh, good for you. And uh, during the day, though, you might get a little bit hungry, but there's things you can do. So if you, ate, if you eat the right food, you won't be hungry after you eat. And if you eat the wrong food, which most of us do, at least one or two things is off, then an hour or two later, we're like, man, I really want some food. I, I got a sugar craving. What's going on? And then you have to work on it. So learning how to eat is an important part of not experiencing pain during a fast. But people are like, okay, I can do a 24-hour fast. Man, I feel so good. I'm rocking it. What's really happening, though, is they're kind of getting a little bit stressed biologically. They're feeling good mentally. But their body's saying, okay, I'm making a lot of cortisol and adrenaline right now. Uh, which I'm using to break down some muscles so I can have enough glucose to keep my brain running because this isn't a fat burning body yet. Like your metabolism isn't flexible. And if you've been eating bad fats for years, it's going to take a while to fix your mitochondria. What's the ideal split for you? The ideal split is whatever you'll do. And 16, eight is great, but for so especially 16 women hours of not eating. And then yeah. I eat however much I want in an eight hour window. Or do you Correct. put limitations in the eating window? You can eat as much as you want during the window of Twinkies. Uh, you know, you can, and you'll still get benefits to be perfectly honest. You'll just get more benefits if you eat good stuff during right. the window. And that's the other thing. Okay. Maybe you don't want to go grass fed only. Maybe you don't want to eliminate French fries from your universe. Okay, fine. Intermittent fasting will help everybody even on a complete crap diet. However, you'll be more hungry during your intermittent fast if you eat crap. So you got to deal with that. And ideally what you're eating after you break your fast, you can have carbs or not have carbs, but don't have sugar don't have seed oils and eat grass-fed meat or don't eat meat. And if you follow those basic principles, and there's other nuances in there, what you find is that you feel really good. And the next morning, you wake up and you're not ravenous. And you're like, oh yeah, I don't even want breakfast. And, and that's a very liberating thing. Because if we're spending so many of our thoughts every day on food, 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 and then you just aren't hungry, it really changes things. So, so I, I want millions of people to say, I'm going to try this basic thing. I'm not going to worry about getting my diet perfect. I might make a few changes, but I'm just going to learn how to intermittent fast. And what I don't want them to do is what a lot of the fasting community does, where it's all about the fast. And, you know, every month I'm going to fast for a week. And, and what you end up doing is you get people who become, um, they basically burn out their adrenals. And so women see sleep problems as the first symptom that they're overdoing it. And then they see hormonal problems in their monthly cycle and then see hair loss and hair thinning. Guys, same thing, but it's usually two to four weeks out for women. First is sleep problems, then you wake up and there isn't a kickstand. And then you- <laughs> It took me a second, took a minute. I got there, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then after that, you can see hair thinning as well. And this is from excess cortisol because you overdid it. And you can see the same thing from just being keto for three months straight. Right? That's why I've always recommended cycling because I made all these mistakes <laughs> when I was learning about all this stuff. It was just very early days. And, and so how do you make this sustainable? And the truth is fasting the same way every day is bad for you because it doesn't lend 
your body the idea of metabolic flexibility. It's like, oh, I live in a world where there's almost never enough food. So have breakfast every now and then. At least, you know, Saturday morning, have breakfast with your family. And you can have a keto breakfast or you can have the gluten-free waffles, whatever you want. You should be able to handle that. Just don't eat bad oils. And over time, it takes about two years to replace half your cell membranes, the oil in those membranes. Over time, you'll become more and more metabolically flexible because your cells work better. But if while you're intermittent fasting, you're still eating a ton of junk food, you won't get that benefit, but you'll get many other benefits of fasting. You're still going to lose weight. You're still going to have uh, an improved blood sugar profile, but not as good as if you made a few changes in the diet. So this is something everyone can do that's cheaper and more convenient than what you do in the morning right now. I used to get just, Dave, ferociously cold. Like I was cold all the time. Me too. I was like bundled up. I had, I lost a ton of weight, so I lost 60 pounds but I did it really stupidly <laughs> and I did it through essentially rabbit starvation. I wasn't yeah. eating any fat, no carbs, 85, maybe a little more percentage of my calories came from protein. I was basically eating boiled chicken breasts and steamed broccoli all day, every day. It's a crappy life, isn't it? Oh my God, it was horrible, <laughs> yes. horrible. And finally, my wife and my business partners pulled me aside and said, dude, you no longer have a personality. Yeah. Like it, uh, it just sucked, <laughs> but I got super lean, right. but I, almost certainly did some sort of cellular or metabolic damage. And for years mm -hmm. after that, I was so fucking cold all the time. Yeah. Now that didn't change until I started taking cold showers. And now I find that like, I'm just not that cold very often anymore. Interesting. So I have definitely developed a resilience to cold. Did you ever have your thyroid levels checked? I did not that I paid attention so to. How what about that? What probably happened is that something happened that lowered your thyroid function, which is part of the reason you got fat. Because your thyroid is the thermostat for all your cells. The mitochondria listen to thyroid hormone to figure out what to do. And this is why in Superhuman, I talk about the vegan trap. <laughs> Tell me more. This is one of the more interesting parts of the book. And so I was a raw vegan for a, a while. I was cold when I was a raw vegan too, come to think of it. Um, That's interesting. But, and I got a lot of other health issues I hadn't had before, even though I did lose some weight on that. But what happens is uh, you say, all right, based on an assumption, uh, and the assumption is it's going to make me healthy or it's going to be better for the planet, both of which are wrong, by the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did this, and what happens for the first six weeks is the type of fat in your cell membranes changes, mm -hmm. and it changes to match vegetables. Newsflash, we're not vegetables. So as that happens, your body says, oh, my ability to make energy just went down. I will compensate by turning up my thyroid hormone. But then at a certain point, your thyroid is turned all the way up and then nothing, nothing's happening. You're still not making enough energy and then you can get thyroid problems, including Hashimoto's, which mm. is a common problem of doing that. And not to mention you're eating excessive carbs just by definition, because that's what plants make right. mostly. And the vegan trap there is this idea that you feel great for six weeks. The period of time that it takes to make a new habit is 40 days, or maybe it's six weeks, which is 42 days. And after that period of time, like, look, I felt better on the vegan diet, and you did. You cranked up your thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. So now you feel good, and that can't be why I'm not feeling good. That can't be why I'm getting cold. But that's the vegan trap, is that you, you were convinced it made you feel good because it did, mm. so it can't be that. And you start looking at all these other things. Well, it's maybe it's because I'm not vegan enough. Like, I'm gonna cut out salt, right? And like, you just keep doing these things, trying to figure out why didn't I recapture that initial glow? Mm. And it's because various biological systems are turning off. So for cleansing or whatever, be a vegan for a little while, it's great. The rest of the time, you should be pretty much 80, 90% vegan with some of the types of fat that you're made out of, which are saturated fats, so you don't get the right ones from plants alone, uh, and the amount of building block protein that your body needs. Things like collagen protein are essential. You do not need the amount of animal protein that most people eat, and you should never eat industrially raised animal proteins. It's bad right. for them, and it's bad for the soil, it's bad for the earth, and it's bad for your soul, depending on whatever soul uh, belief systems you have. Like, nobody wins uh, when you crowd animals. So I will eat the vegan meal every time, or I'll fast before I'll eat the, the industrially raised feedlot animals. It's, it's not okay. However, um, I have a small farm. I raise sheep and pigs, and I eat them, and they're delicious. And I don't eat a lot of them because you don't need a lot of them. And the total deaths per calorie on the Bulletproof diet, which is primarily vegetables, which don't kill anything. Grains actually do kill a lot of things through habitat destruction and just mechanized uh, cutting down of crops. Mm. 
Uh, so we have big problems there where a tractor comes through and kills the turtles, the bunnies, the ladybugs, the butterflies, and destroys lots of crops for you to get low yield calories from these things. So what you probably need is uh, four ounces and maybe six ounces um, of meat a day and not more than that. And the guidelines in Superhuman, that's for normal people. If you're a weightlifter um, or you're over age 60, it's probably 0.6 grams per pound of body weight, which is way less than bodybuilders sometimes it's one or two mm, grams. Yeah. So you can really want to pound your protein. And what the studies are showing is whether it's animal or plant protein, you don't want to overdo protein like you did with the rabbit thing mm. there. If you eat more than 20% of your calories from protein, it is mm. going to cause a four times higher increase in all cause mortality. Is that protein no matter the source? Ah, uh, I know like sure if it's fried and stuff like that. Oh no, that there's, bad, oh, there's but... the, the cooking of the protein really matters, but it, it actually matters based on amino acid ratios. Okay. So are you saying 20% whether it's plant or animal? Animal protein is worse for the 20%, but if you eat 20% plant protein, you're still not going to get the benefits and you're going to start having problems from it. So there are essential amino acids. Amino acids, uh, they're the building blocks of proteins. So you can kind of look at those, they're letters in the alphabet. Yep. And then you string them together and you get peptides, which are protein fragments. And you, so each, each peptide's a word. And when you put the words together into a sentence, that's a protein, right? And so if you look at the composition of letters that are in what you eat, there's ones that are required for us to live called cysteine and methionine and tryptophan. Mm -hmm. So you must have them or over time you'll starve. Slight problem, if you have too much of them, they lead to systemic inflammation. Systemic inflammation is a sign of mitochondrial dysfunction, which means they're making you older. So your risks for cancer and cardiovascular disease do go up if you overconsume animal protein. So then the logic would say, well, don't eat any of it then, except for the fact that you need those, they're essential and they're building blocks. The good news is that almost no one is gonna be protein deficient if they were to go vegan. It's not about protein. You might miss a few of your conditionally essential ones, but you would miss out on things like collagen proteins, including dientripeptides that really help you to build the cartilage in your joints and keep mm. your skin working. And the types of fats that come in animals are very important. So what you end up finding is all of us should be eating way less animals, but that doesn't mean we should eat zero animals. All of us should be eating way more dairy fat, but not more dairy protein, because that protein is, is not the ideal protein for us. You can have some of it, but you don't need too much of it. And you end up in this thing where we've made these artificial divides of that's a plant-based protein, therefore it's good for you. Or we could just say, guys, different proteins do different things and you should choose the right proteins, whether they come from a, a test tube, whether they come from an animal, look at what the protein is, the source is less important. And then you look at the source and you say, okay, which of these sources builds our soil and makes for a healthy world where there is diversity? And I, I just ha having run uh, an organic farm that looks at permaculture, I can tell you, I can't eat grass, but I can eat the thing that ate the grass mm. and it's poop sure is good for the garden, right? So we have this, this ecosystem yeah. where we all get along and this is how it worked before there were humans. We had a hundred million buffalo running around in the US keeping our soil healthy mm. as part of, that, that's their job was to go out and fertilize things. And it's, it's very interesting to watch how we, we've taken on these belief systems um, that you know nothing can ever die, not paying attention to the fact that when the tractor came through and cut the bread for your sandwich, that you killed many, many creatures. And back when we had a health ecosystem, you could walk around behind the tractor with a bag and pick up hundreds of frogs and snakes. You could have frog legs for dinner every time they cut the grain. Well, now all the frogs are dead and there's no more snakes because we have monoculture everywhere. But hey, at least we're not killing anything. How do you really feel, Dave? <laughs> Let me ask you, what do you think about the carnivore diet? I did something similar to that when I was testing out like the edges of the Bulletproof recommendations. I did one serving of vegetables a day for three months, right? So it wasn't pure carnivore uh, because you know I did eat a little bit of broccoli every day. Mm, shame on it you. It jacked me up. Really? Oh my God. Did you transition though? Or did you just like hammer over? Well, I was already you know, doing keto and cyclical and, and the but keto diet with stuff. Uh, meat or keto plant based. Oh, keto with meat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, you're one of the few people I've heard like really throw out some heavy warnings about protein. So keep going. Got it. When you say that it jacked you up, here's uh, what it did. Yep. 
Uh, I was tracking my sleep. I've tracked my sleep for almost 15 years. Yeah, I had six a, hours and 17 minutes or something. I'm so fucking close to the truth. What is it? Six hours and 10 minutes, but you're... See? Come you're, on. You're seven down. minutes off? All right. I'm going to give you full credit on that <laughs> one. That, that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, and this is like for many years now that much sleep, and I, I, my percentage of deep and REM keeps going up. But during that time, I felt really good for the first week or two, and after that, my sleep... I was waking up 10 to 12 times a night without knowing it. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd look at my Whoa. results, I'm like, this is the worst sleep ever, what's going on? And I had uh, like, like a kind of a constant headache, and I, I got angry, and I was, my joints hurt, and it, it was not working. And I was really convinced, okay, we, we don't need any carbs, by the way, that's wrong, you do need carbs. And I think what it did is it... Tell me more. Is Why it, do you say that? Because it, as of this moment, mm -hmm. I don't believe that to be true. Do we need so carbs? tell me how I'm wrong. Um, because the gut bacteria that eat carbs benefit from soluble fiber. So if you're not getting soluble fiber, there's a whole chapter in here on that. You can still be keto and have soluble fiber, but you got to have something to feed certain species mm -hmm. of gut bacteria so they can do stuff. Now, if you go back, a Bulletproof Diet was the first book in the entire genre that talked about how collagen can be... Uh, used in the gut to make butyric acid. So maybe my problem was I was eating too many ribeyes and I wasn't eating enough collagen when I was doing my, my diet there. Uh, I've interviewed Steve Omohundro. Um, this is a guy who's a leader in artificial intelligence creating a global brain who came down with um, uh, cancer in his blood. And he'd been fighting it for a long time with, and it was, he was slowly going down. Went carnivore, cured him. Whoa. completely fixed and mm. so he came on and talked about that there's pictures of his freezer and things it's all just meat so i'm a huge fan just like i would say go vegan for a month go right, carnivore for a month reset your gut bacteria uh, i actually have questions about the sustainability um, of eating only grass-fed meat mm. and i know if we took most of our golf courses and turned them into grass-fed meat uh, production facilities i.e farms uh, we could handle a lot more than we do but we're just eating too much meat as a species. So as a, a brief intervention to cure yourself, I, I'm in huge support of it, but you better do nose to tail. And being the guy who has learned how to take our lambs down, you know, how to, how to take them down, as in I haven't, like, I've learned how to, at a butcher shop how to do it. Mm. There's a lot of stuff in there that you're supposed to be eating that you don't. And the idea here is you need to get the skin, you need to get the organs and things like that if mm. you're going to go carnivore. So there's, there's a case for it. There are people who've done it for many years successfully. I think it's very expensive, very limiting, and probably bad for the planet mm. and maybe good for you, but uh, I'd want right. to see more evidence. All right. Give me some rapid fire things that are going to help me be superhuman. Green tea, black coffee, dark chocolate, blueberries, sleeping like a professional, even if you get less sleep. Give me some of your sleep tips. Like, is it timing, obviously light, you're like fucking right. synonymous with blue blocking. Yeah, I, I did make those kind of cool. <laughs> I, I have a company called True Dark, just you know, full disclosure, I founded the thing. But if I don't wear my glasses before bed for at least an hour, I do not get the one and a half to two hours of deep sleep that I expect mm. in six hours. If in, this is even if the lights are dim, and it, it doesn't matter. It, it really matters. If I travel, it matters even more. So I landed last night. I got to my hotel around midnight, mm. and I got my hour and forty minutes of deep sleep last night in a hotel after landing and coming in. That I could never do that ever. Mm. That's amazing. That's the glasses. But for dreaming, it's been a real problem. Getting enough REM sleep for me for years has mm. been an issue. And there's a company called Lifecycle that makes an Australian lion's mane mushroom extract. I had the guys on the show. They went really deep on the science. And I've, lion's mane is well known for its cognitive enhancing properties. Um, this stuff for sleep, though, uh, is something that, that, that has worked for me. And I can tell you, if I don't, I do a lot. I do five droppers of it. If I do that, I get my hour and a half of REM. Mm. And if I don't, I'm going to get 30 minutes. The other things that work, aside from dark, you know, that lowering the temperature of the room, for people who wake up late, like three or four in the morning and can't go back to sleep racing thoughts, that's a cortisol and a fueling issue. Before bed, you need either raw honey or collagen or MCT oil slash brain octane, or maybe all three. And there's different pathways. Raw honey, not in hot water because it's not raw anymore, raises liver glycogen, but not uh, muscle glycogen. And we're talking a small amount. It stabilizes it so you don't get a blood sugar crash. Brain Octane provides ketones, which are the backup energy supply for the brain to mm. pump itself out at night. 
And for some people, the amino acid glycine that's present in collagen can be calming and help them sleep through the night. Hmm. I do those. I take the sleep mode supplement I formulated. Blackout curtains are a necessity at this point. Raising the head of your bed by six inches, there's really good evidence that that's going to change blood flow dynamics and cerebral spinal fluid dynamics in the brain and make it easier for your brain to drain stuff out. That's interesting. So literally, put a couple of bricks under the head of your bed. <laughs> it, it's pretty easy to do that, and it's a one-time hack that can have mm. ongoing benefits. Hmm. What about red and amber light? Amber light is good. Amber light, in fact, true light, one of the parts of true dark, we make a light that uses amber for like blood vessel formation in the skin along with collagen regeneration. And so there's usefulness for that. During the day, you usually see me wearing uh, yellow glasses that block some blue light, but not all, because you need blue light during the day. Mm. So amber light as a therapeutic wavelength on the skin, it works on blood vessels uh, mostly and on fine wrinkles. Red light, and infrared light also work on fine wrinkles, on collagen regeneration, on tissue regeneration. And if you're looking to use an amber light at night, it turns out blue blocking isn't enough to make you go to sleep. There's four kinds of light that mess with your sleep and blue blockers only get one of the four. So your melatonin will go up, but the other three are still there. So you need to block all four. That's why the sleep glasses are different than blue blocking. Mm. Uh, so you see a lot of people walking around blue blockers during the day. They got no daytime signal at all, so that's a bad thing. Um, but if you're walking around under bright LEDs and staring at your screen on full power all day, you're getting an overwhelm of daylight signal. So it's about getting it, uh, getting it right. But for me, it's that hour before bed where you just have to nail it. Mm. Uh, and for looking younger, red light therapy is profound for the skin. And what, can, what do you use for red light therapy? Is there a device? Yeah, there's a, a variety of devices. So you go to uh, Upgrade Labs. We have you know, the, the many tens of thousands of dollar whole body thing. You kind of mm. roast on it with systemic effects, including you can actually see your nitric oxide levels go up on a, on a, a spit strip after you're exposed to the red light. It has biological effects. And then it's kind of the mid-range of cost and performance. There's a company called Juve, and they have a very, uh, very powerful LEDs in an array. And then at the, the most affordable end of things is the True Light stuff from the company I have that makes the glasses. They're more affordable, they have yellow, uh, they have the red and they have the infrared, but they're not as powerful as LEDs. Mm. So I would say you got to look at your, your, your price point, where you want to go, what you want to do. But it's an LED therapy kind of thing. And you know, Juve makes a little box you can take with you and they, there's panels you can string together. Uh, bottom line is, if you're feeling weird in your stomach and you're, you have nausea or you have a headache and you put red light on your stomach or on your head, it's shocking what happens. There's studies of putting red light in conjunction with ketosis. And they looked at, somewhere in Minnesota, they looked at say a dozen people, they put them on a strict keto diet, they put them on red light therapy with a strict keto diet and a standard diet and red light therapy with a standard diet. And the men who were on keto plus red light therapy had a doubling of testosterone production. But Whoa. keto alone and red light alone both bumped it up, but nowhere near as much. So there's mm. synergistic effects between keto and red light, which is really cool. Is there a timing of that? Like, when do you want your red light? In the morning, in the night? Um, generally, you just think of sunset and sunrise. Okay. So you would do it when you wake up, do it before bed. And during the day, if you, if you have time, you know, and you're looking at skin repair or something, you can do it any time during the day, but the two peak periods are before bed and uh, upon waking. Nice. All right, man, there is a lot more in this book. You are a very easy man to find online, but where's your ideal for people to connect with you? Where's your ideal for people to snatch up the book? Go to daveasprey.com, and this is my author URL. You can clearly go to bulletproof.com, pick up all the cool Bulletproof stuff. Um, I've put most of my blog posts and all the podcast transcripts and all that kind of stuff on daveasprey.com, so go there, and if you send me your receipt from picking up Superhuman, um, there's eight interviews with like the leading gods of anti-aging that are just for people who picked up the books. I'm really serious about this, you know, building a community around people that do the stuff that has been a nonprofit activity for me for 20 years that's mm. now becoming my, my primary focus. Nice, man. What's one change that you would have people make that would take them the farthest towards becoming superhuman? This is going to sound really, really lame, but it's probably sleep today. Doesn't sound lame to me at all. I mean, I, I like to tell you, you should meditate or you should, you know, make sure that you're not eating toxins. It, it all, it's synergistic. But seriously, if you just learn to get better sleep in whatever time you have to sleep, 
it is the most leveraged return on investment mm -hmm. and it's probably also the cheapest thing you can do. So that and maybe learning some breathing exercises is a pretty good deal. Nice. So I don't think um, we closed the loop on metabolic flexibility before. So metabolic flexibility okay. being um, that you've got on one hand, you can burn the glucose and then on the other that you can burn ketones. Uh, most people, yep. unless they're paying attention, never get into a space where they can burn ketones because they're not creating ketones. Um, can you give people a really fast, because I want to get back to what an ideal fast looks like according to Fast This Way. Um, but first, give people a quick breakdown about how you put your body in a state where it will produce ketones and exactly what they are. Ketones are what happens when your body burns fat instead of sugar. Naturally, it doesn't happen if you're consuming carbohydrates in any meaningful amount, and it doesn't happen if you're eating a ton of protein. And what happens when you do that is ketones have more energy in them than glucose does. And the neurons in your brain love ketones. In fact, all the cells in your body do, but some of them prefer blood glucose. So all of a sudden you get this feeling of clarity. And the natural way to get into ketosis is you fast for about two days for the average person, sometimes three. And then the body says, I got nothing here. I better start burning my fat stores. So it liberates some fat from the fat stores and all the toxins from the fat it liberates as well, which is why it's good to mop them up while you're fasting. And then your cells get, get this and they go, oh man, we've got to reformat our power plants because they're used to only having sugar. So it takes metabolic energy to transform and they literally change their shape and function so that they're better at consuming fat, right? And that takes a while. Now you're metabolically flexible, but if you do that all the time forever, your cells are like, why would I ever be configured to do glucose? I live in a world with no sugar. So they aren't very good at that, which is why cycling in and out of ketosis, fasting some of the time, but not other times and not fasting the same way every day or every week is really powerful. You want to keep the body a little bit off balance. So it's like, you know what? I'm ready to make energy at any time rapidly from any type of fuel. And when you do that, you can actually go out and have a bowl of hopefully dairy-free ice cream uh, without bad fats in it. So a coconut-based ice cream and uh, with real sugar and everything. And it'll happen. Your blood sugar will go up and come right back down and you'll be fine. And that's a metabolically flexible person. You do it all the time. You won't be metabolically flexible, right? But if you're the guy who has ice cream every single night, well, then what's going to happen is you're not going to know how to burn fat whatsoever. Your body's going to be only sugar burning, and it's it's not going to work, and your blood sugar will always be high. So the idea is occasionally it's okay to have some carbs. I don't recommend you know ice cream as a major source, but honestly, if you're intermittent fasting, you're occasionally in ketosis, you ought to be able to eat a treat that isn't full of inflammatory stuff like bad oils and all and be just fine. And the evidence is that people whose metabolisms work really well, they can do it and their blood sugar doesn't go bonkers. Mm. Okay. Now, if we were going to give somebody the fastest way starter kit, um, you know, sort of a, what is a basic week look like? What is, what is a good entry point where they're not hangry? They're not going crazy, but they're still getting some benefits, anti-inflammatory. They're maybe in, uh, you know, ketosis. They've got some autophagy going on. Like what does that starter kit fast look like? All right. I'm going to, to explain that right here. I'm also going to offer, um, because I was a teacher for five years at the University of California, I wrote every book I've written. I haven't really been a great teacher of the content. I just write them like you should read it. When people order Fast This Way and send the receipt to fastthisway.com, um, I will teach you this over two weeks, like every morning explaining, walking people through this who are new to fasting, ending in a one or two day spiritual fast. So that's the long answer to the question is it's going to take me two weeks, but I'll show you. The short answer is that do 12 hours without food. See if you can do that if you've never done it before. That's not really technically an intermittent fast. You're just showing yourself you've got legs. And you work yourself up to 14 hours without food. And that's when you're really starting a real intermittent fast. And then you maybe the next day you have breakfast. Just lots of protein, lots of fat, no carbs for breakfast. Right? You're taking it easy. And then the next day, okay, I'm going to do a 16-hour fast. And you're, you may use all three of the fasting hacks because you're ravenous. When I was 300 pounds, if you told me I was going to skip breakfast and lunch, I'm like, I will kill the people around me. Like, I will be such a jerk. And it was true. I, I ate six or eight times a day because I knew I'd go into starvation mode if I didn't. And all this, like, mental garbage we've been told. So what you end up with is this idea where you're slowly going to work your way up. And it's okay to do that. And some morning, someone's going to bring in donuts and you're just going to break your fast. And in the book, I explain the psychology and the biology of why that happens. And it's just, it's okay, right? You have the rest of your life to, to, to do this. That's why it's called a fasting practice. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be perfect. And 
once you get up to that 68, one day you're going to sit there and go, you know what? It's lunchtime, but I'm actually not that hungry. So I am going to, for the first time in my adult life, I'm going to just say, I'm not going to eat till dinner. And then you're really kind of tricking yourself because it's only like four or five more hours until you've had dinner anyway. And then you're going, wait a minute. The last time I ate was dinner yesterday. But it wasn't pain. It wasn't suffering. It wasn't struggle. It wasn't strife. It wasn't pushing. It was just, oh, okay, I could do that. Yeah, I was a little hungry in the afternoon, but I drank some extra water, right? Maybe you did use coffee. Right, coffee's good for you anyway, right? It's okay. And With then no sugar dinner. or cream, I'm assuming. Thank you. No sugar, no cream, no protein, no artificial sweetener either. You can use stevia or monk fruit if you want to, but definitely not NutraSweet or Splenda because those wreck your gut bacteria. Mm. And it it's really shocking. And you see this look of wonder like, wow, I can't believe I, I thought I would die. Right. But I didn't. I just did 24 hours. And as we talked about earlier, that's, you know, one meal a day. But if the next day you're like, I did it yesterday, I'm going to do it again today. And you're still just getting into it. You're probably not going to feel as good. Right. So the next day, go back to 16, eight, right? Like slowly work up to it. And what you're doing, it's like you go to the gym saying, I haven't worked out in two years, but I'm going to go do a full CrossFit workout. Right. I'm going to do the full wad. And then the next day you're laying on your back and you're like, I think I have to go to the hospital. My kidneys are overloaded with protein breakdown. You know, I, I hate my life. It's, it's because it's OK when you're exercising your cells the way fasting does. It's OK to just get started in a healthy, gentle way and work yourself up to this. I can fast for 48 hours and still be totally fine and, and have my brain work and do interviews like this. And I feel great. I can also eat and feel great. But before I'd eat and then I get the food coma and then you don't feel very good and then you got to have some sugar. That doesn't happen either. But if you just go all in and say, I'm going to start with a 10-day water fast, man, you're going to feel like crap. And the deal here is fasting is not about deprivation and it's not supposed to be about willpower unless you're doing a spiritual fast. And what I would say is do fasting in a painless way, which is a big part of the book, or Choose to face the pain and use it as a spiritual, personal development practice. The arc of the book, when I first started this, I was afraid of, of being hungry. I was afraid of being alone, uh, which I, was something I came up, up with through my personal development work. I'm like, well, I didn't realize this. So I, I hired a shaman to drop me off in the middle of nowhere in a cave. There's no food and there's no people for 10 miles in any direction. And I'm like, I'm going to be here for four days, and it, I'm scared, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty scared of this, to be perfectly honest. This is the first time I'd done a four-day fast. And when I got out of there, I couldn't believe the energy I had. And I, I talk in, in the book about, you know, the, the mental process you go through the first time you do a fast like that. And that is a spiritual practice. And that's why at the end of this, this challenge I'm running for people – I am going to say, all right, here's the meditation work that you do. Here's understanding the voice in your head because there's these three voices in your head that make you do everything you've ever been ashamed of. And they're coming from mitochondria and gut bacteria. And getting on top of that and just owning that, that's awesome. But if you have to own it every day on top of everything else in your life, it's going to be overwhelming and it's going to raise your cortisol and you don't need to do that to get the benefits. What are the three voices? This is the algorithm that all life runs. It doesn't matter if you're a plant, it doesn't matter if you're a bacteria, which is what's powering us, or whether you know, you're know you a deer. And the first rule is run away from, kill, or hide from everything. So that's fear. And you put 10 times more energy on that than is necessary, right? Because from the perspective of making a life form that will always be around, it should protect itself. And you protect yourself if you're a plant with you know, hard shells or spikes or toxins. And if you're a bacteria, you use toxins or other defense things. And if you're a person, you think you're out of it. And the second F word, which gets about five times more attention than normal, is eat everything. Because famines kill lots of things. So now we have fear and we have food. right? And that's why food gets so much attention when you're fasting. Because your bacteria are like, eat that, eat that, eat that, eat that, eat that. And you're like, no, no, no. And eventually it's like a little kid wearing you down. And okay, fine, you can have half the cookie, Johnny. And they're like, why don't I eat the cookie? I'm such a bad person. No, your mitochondria got the best of you. It's okay. And then the third F word, what else does all life have to do to make sure it's on the earth forever, Tom? Fornicate, baby. Oh, I was thinking fertility, but if you want to just go straight to I'll that. Go, I'll I, go uh, right there. <laughs> you're correct. So uh, I actually was thinking of the other F word. I was just trying to get you to say it. <laughs> so nice dodge. What, um, what's going on there is that gets about three times more attention than it deserves, right? And all life has to do it. And this explains everything you've ever done that you're ashamed of. Like all 
procrastination, all resistance, all not seeing things, all that's fear, right? Eating all the stuff you shouldn't eat, that's food. Going on that date you know you shouldn't have gone on, <laughs> that is the other F word, right? And this is in our cells. This is not your brain. This is your cellular biology driving you to do it. And the saving grace in all of this, and this is towards the end of the book, is that there is a fourth F word that all life does, and it's friend. And this is why we form communities, why we specialize, and we're actually wired to help each other, right? But if you're so wrapped up in hunger and so wrapped up in lack of love and so wrapped up in fear, whether it's from watching too much news or just your old programming, it's like, oh, no, if, if, you know, if my boss yells at me, I'm a bad person, no one will love me, ah, and you just lose it. So if those are going on, we aren't there to help other people. And if you can turn off the hunger voice, it frees up so much more energy that you can now do the work necessary to turn down the fear and to make sure that you're managing the love in your life. And all of a sudden, you're a better person than you were before. And, and this is why fasting is so important because it has the power to give you the energy to overcome the other F words that are messing with you on a daily basis. And it's, it's not because we're bad people. It's a separate operating system meant to keep you alive. It's not trying to harm you. It just makes you do stupid stuff all the time. And fasting is a way out of that trap. Is that the reason that this is uh, such a time-honored tradition for spiritual traditions to use fasting, or is there something more? Was there what were all the things that you learned or discovered in the cave? There are two reasons that spiritual fasting works, and I actually reference a bunch of different fasting practices from around the world in the book that are all spiritual traditions. One of them is that. When the neurons in your brain get ketones from fasting, you actually think better. You have more energy for thinking and for awareness. Food tastes better. Colors are brighter, right? And you're, you're aware of sensations in your body and the world around you. It's like someone went from black and white to color TV. So, so you get this, this energy. It's like, wow, I, I like this. And if you take that energy and you turn it inwards, you become aware of what's going on in there in a way that you normally wouldn't be. And I believe that's a part of it. And the other part of it is – you know, you do have to to feel the hunger and have willpower to overcome the hunger for two days or so. And it's about showing yourself who's in charge, right? And that is a spiritual practice in and of itself. But it's uh, the clarity that comes. And with that clarity, you can do deep work. I want to talk about that growing part. So you said in the cave, you know, doing a extended fast like that, you're creating the space to do the deep work or you have the energy to do the deep work. What was the deep work? Like, what was it that... And I mean, you talk about it in the book, so I don't think I'm going out of school here, but what was it sure. that drew you to wanting to do a spiritual fast? Um, and then, you know, what, what did you encounter that you've taken with you? Well, I'd, I'd lost a lot of weight, but I recognize I, I still had a, you know, a fear of being hungry because when your metabolism doesn't work, when you're as fat as I was, if you don't have food, your brain stops working. I had a great career in Silicon Valley, you know, very cognitively demanding, but interesting and fascinating. And you're in a meeting and you're like, my brain won't work. Like I'm trying to think right now and I got nothing. Like the accelerator's all the way to the floor and I'm slowing down. I can push hard, but it doesn't matter how much I try. It doesn't matter how much I want. It's not a willpower or a moral issue. It's a biological issue. So you become afraid of being hungry because you don't want to be disabled, right? And I had that and I recognized I had that and I didn't know what to do about it. So I said, well, I'm just going to you know, face it. And one thing that happens when you face your fears, they lose their power. So for me in the cave, I'm like, there's no one around. Like, showing myself I'm actually still safe with no food. I'm, I'm still safe with no companionship, right? And then to be able to go, you know what? Great, I'm not going to die. And that soaks into your body. It, what did it's you not do just during the day? Thing. You're just sitting there thinking? You're walking around? I, I sat there. I'd think and I'd say, you know what? Okay, I'm just going to go walk. I'd walk up the little canyon where I was. You know, I'd stack up rocks. I had a little journal uh, and, and just really feel. But, you know, you, you think about all the stuff you've done. Uh, that you're like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Like, oh, now I understand what was driving me to do that. And, and you really, you, you gain insight and, and you you feel way more connected uh, to the world around you. And like most people are like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to fast. I'm going to have my metabolism. I'm going to get younger. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get abs. I'm going to get all these benefits. And like, actually, you have no distractions when you're fasting. So if you remove all the distractions from your world and you do some of the other things that I talk about in the book briefly, you know, fasting from sex, is a, a very powerful practice that raises your testosterone if you're a man. If you're a woman, it probably isn't beneficial. Um, there's other things towards the end of the book, like fasting from hate. Like try to go four hours without thinking one bad thought about another person. 
and then go 24 hours. It is remarkably difficult to do that. And you become aware during that time. I cannot believe how often I'm like sending dirt towards people that I didn't know I was doing. It costs you to send them dirt. You got to make the electrons do that. And it gives, it does nothing for you. Mm. Right. So you can go without many different things, but when you have the clarity and the time to sit in a cave and be like, why am I thinking about this right now? Like, why is it pushing my buttons? Why did that show up for me right now? And then you, you dig on it. Like, oh my God, I'd never thought about it like that. And this is one of I had the clarity of ketones. Right, I had zero inputs anywhere. I had no food in front of me to to challenge me, and I could say, "Oh, I'm really hungry." And then I'm like, "Why am I thinking that? I know there's no food here." And like, who's thinking that? Because it's not me. And then you realize, oh, there actually is a separate consciousness that's driving my biology. And I, I mean, you can see the effect of that consciousness using neurofeedback and all. It's one of the things I do at my neurofeedback company, um, Forty Years of Zen, and. It's wow, there's this whole thing that's like making me worry about stuff that I know isn't a threat. And it's making me worry about food when I know I'm not going to starve. And I'm like, wait, why? What? And, and then you start really getting in there. And you, when you're done with a spiritual fast like that, you can develop a sense of, of first empathy. Right? Like, oh, I, I feel the pain that I felt. I feel the pain of others when they're hungry. Right. And then the, the level beyond that in spiritual teaching, teachings is a sense of compassion, where instead of having to feel everyone else's pain, you can see the pain and you feel open heartedness towards them and you know, want to serve without taking it in. And the final state, which is the hardest one to develop in these open hearted Buddhist practices is equanimity, which is where you can be completely calm and at peace no matter what's happening inside or outside of you. And, and that's the kind of things that can develop when you sit in the cave for days because you're like, wow, I had all this garbage in my mind that I didn't know was in there because I had nothing else to do but unpack it. And we're just too busy to do that. But I, I would say the fasting runs from I skipped breakfast and I had more energy and I'm better off metabolically all the way up to I sat somewhere for several days in intense personal development. But when most people hear fasting, all they hear is I'll starve, therefore I'll die. And then they, they blank out to it. And no, this is about more energy and it's about more clarity and less time wasted and less pain in your life. Yeah. And hearing you describe the way people push back, seeing how even today sort of the mainstream um, medical establishment thinks of fasting and how it's considered so sort of outlandish. And, you know, people immediately go to, well, you're going to give um, people anorexia and it's such a bizarre reaction. And when you think about those three F's and, and the fear that seems to be driving people's perception of this, do you have like a magic phrase or idea that you can give to people that are really resistant to get them to try it? You can fast without ever being hungry and without ever suffering and you'll have more energy. But when I was you know, really heavy still, I was eating super healthy, what I thought was healthy, you know, low fat, <laughs> low calorie stuff. Uh, but I was still working on it. And if you'd have told me I had to fast, I'd be like, no, like, I'm not going to do that. I'll go into starvation mode and it's going to suck. And then I won't be able to do my job. And, you know, I'll act like a jerk and all that stuff. That message is playing super loud mm -hmm. for everyone who's got extra pounds. And then they have this desire to fast, but then you feel like a failure because the automated system in your body wants you to eat and you don't know how to deal with it. So the deal is, I'm going to put you in charge. That that's what's going on here. And so all of the bad things that you think about fasting won't happen. What's going to happen is you're going to save time and you're going to feel better than you do today and you'll never be hungry. And then they're like, okay, I'm going to try this once. I think you're full of crap. And they almost always start with a fasting hack. There's a reason that there's been several hundred million cups of bulletproof coffee and people have lost a million pounds on the bulletproof diet. It's because when they had that fat in the morning, they were intermittent fasting. They just didn't feel hungry. And for the first time in their lives, when lunchtime came around, they're like, I guess I could eat <laughs> instead of the way I used to be, which is like, what's for lunch? What's for lunch? Tacos? You know, it, that whole voice, it just shuts up. And oh my God, it's so liberating. Yeah, it really does change your relationship to hunger. That was the thing that I could never quite get people to understand about ketosis specifically. And it's not like you're not hungry. It's that it doesn't have a grip on you which is very, yeah. very different. It, it's because there's two things that we confuse. One is a craving and the other is hunger. And hunger is the sense that, you know what? It's time to eat sometime soon, uh, but I could wait a while. 
and a craving is if I don't eat right now, someone's going to die, <laughs> whether it's me or someone else. <laughs> and most people eat in such a way that they always experience cravings and they've never experienced just hunger without a craving. I was like that 100%. Mm. And when you clean out the stuff that's causing the cravings, like, wow, uh, the experience of lunch is so different. What is up, my friend? Tom Bilyeu here, and I have a big question to ask you. How would you rate your level of personal discipline on a scale of one to 10? If your answer is anything less than a 10, I've got something cool for you. And let me tell you right now, discipline by its very nature means compelling yourself to do difficult things that are stressful, boring, which is what kills most people, or possibly scary or even painful. Now, here is the thing. Achieving huge goals and stretching to reach your potential requires you to do those challenging, stressful things and to stick with them even when it gets boring and it will get boring. Building your levels of personal discipline is not easy, but let me tell you, it pays off. In fact, I will tell you, you're never going to achieve anything meaningful unless you develop discipline. All right, I've just released a class from Impact Theory University called how to build ironclad discipline that teaches you the process of building yourself up in this area so that you can push yourself to do the hard things that greatness is going to require of you. All right, click the link on the screen, register for this class right now, and let's get to work. I will see you inside this workshop from Impact Theory University. Until then, my friends, be legendary. Peace out. You and I share an obsession with the new book. You're living to 180. So your book opens with one of my favorite quotes of all time which is, do not go gently into that good night, rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Why start there? How has this become your obsession? It's funny. There's a very old restaurant in Berkeley, California. In fact, um, my parents uh, used to eat there when my mom was pregnant with me, <laughs> like way back in the day. It's called Spangler's. And they actually have that quote up in, when you enter into the restaurant there. So mm -hmm. I remember when I was a little kid, my grandfather uh, reading that quote to me. And I remember my grandfather was uh, passing away. He was in his, in his 80s and he came down with an autoimmune kidney condition. And he sat down and he said, well, I'm a PhD scientist, chemist. And I know that if I work really hard, I might get to the point where I can sit at home and be well enough to watch golf and do dialysis twice a week for the rest of my life. Wow. I don't want that. So I'm going on the wine diet. And, and he said, wow. call the family. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I'm only having wine, no water, no nothing else. So everyone flew in and he passed away a few days later, literally doing exactly what he said. He just had a few sips of wine whenever he wanted to, but he decided he was going to go. Let's talk about that for a second. Sure. So I'm, I'm actually really interested in this. So. Um, like if I knew that that was a one way street, as much as I want to live forever, 180, like as long as humanly possible, if it got to the end, man, I'm, I'm all about the wine diet or <laughs> euthanasia, quite frankly, like yeah. where do you come down on that? If you think that there's hope and you think that there's hope to have the quality of life that you want, then you fight for it. And Agreed. in fact, one of these guys who never discloses publicly CEO of a Fortune 200 company. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, the same stuff that took out uh, Steve Jobs. And I sat down at the Rosewood Hotel, and uh, he said, Dave, I'm going to tell you what I did. And the day he was diagnosed, he, he said, I'm not going to die. I have, I have a company, and I have kids. This isn't fair. He never told anyone. So he went on a full keto diet that day, and he shrunk his tumor to the point that it became operable. Mm. They did chemo on it, and when the doctors weren't looking, he'd inject insulin to do insulin-potentiated wow. therapy, which works way better than chemotherapy, but the doctors wouldn't do. And so he's like, I'm taking charge. And you know what? He, he did it, right? So, and, I, and in running an anti-aging nonprofit group for 20 years, I have met people who are saying, I have this life-threatening condition, and I am going to own this, and they do. And I've also met with, so I'm going to own this, and at a certain point they go, it's not working. Mm. And then they make peace with it. And the people who die kicking and screaming are the most unhappy. And if you believe any of the Buddhist perspectives on hell or any of those other things like that, those are the people who have probably a shitty afterlife and aren't going to like their next life if you're into reincarnation. Do you believe in that? Absolutely. Really? Yeah. That's so interesting. How did you get into that? Like, when did that become your dominant belief system? There's the Western side of this. Mm -hmm. So I grew up as in a, a in an atheist household full of rigorous engineers and you know <laughs> like only stupid people would believe that stuff but here's what it comes down to if your nervous system believes that you get to you get a game over at the end of this game 
you relax a lot more. Okay. Okay. So, Keep check, going. so check this out. If I can do anything to remove my unconscious fear of death, which inhibits me from doing the things that I want to do when I'm here, if believing in reincarnation can do that, fine, I'll sign up for it. Because here's the deal. If I'm right, great. If I'm wrong, I'm dead. I don't right. care. Like I, I, You can't lose by believing in reincarnation. So I can't tell you that it's provable. I've also done very deep states of neurofeedback. I've done deep stuff shamanic wise. And I've talked to different people from different traditions who look at me and say the same things about stuff that I have no knowledge of. So as a curious person where that scientific method is observe is the first step. Mm. I've observed stuff I can't explain via any normal hypothesis. So I know the stuff that we believe has holes in it just like it does biologically. So I'm just going to say I like that choice best because even if it's complete bullshit, it still enhances my quality of life. That's really interesting. (laughs) So one, the reason that uh, the one thing in all that that doesn't resonate with me Mm -hmm. is that believing that you get a game over at the end of this causes you to relax, which is the exact opposite, I would say, certainly for me. Even if I live forever, like I want to go hard, hard, hard every day, and if there's an end, then I really want to go hard every day. Whereas I feel like the, the opposite might be true. If I knew I were getting reincarnated, one of my lives might be the donut life where I just <laughs> chill and I'm like, look, I'm going to tap out early. I get it, but I'm just going to eat me some tasty food until it comes. It, if you believe, so I, I went to Tibet to learn meditation from the masters. Like I've debated the lamas and what they'll tell you is, oh, you've probably done that. <laughs> <laughs> had the donut life, you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like if you're asking that question now, you probably already had your donut life. Right. Right. So the idea is you're going to keep making the same mistakes for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime until you learn your lesson. So for me, that's pretty good motivation to learn my lesson this time. So I don't have to repeat the lesson again because who wants to repeat first grade over and over right. and over? Eventually that's going to get boring. All right. So while we have this one and this isn't our donut life, Mm -hmm. then what should we be doing? Like, I love the concept that you explore in the book about, okay, you may be here and maybe here is even pretty good, but there actually is something above that and that you're not kidding when you say that you really want to live to 180. How do we actually get there? Like walk us through the, you call it the, the four killers. Sure. Start there. Everything in superhuman comes down to something called return on investment. And it, you just have to look at what you're investing. And we usually think of investment as dollars. But what we're really investing is not even time. We're investing energy. Because if you have energy, you can use the energy to make money. If you have time but no energy, the time is useless. If you have money but no energy, the money is mostly useless unless you spend it to get your energy back, mm-hmm. which is what I had to do when I weighed 300 pounds and you know I was, I was screwed up. So... If you don't have money, you don't have time, you don't have energy, you're in pretty desperate straits. So when it comes to living to 180, what if during this entire life, however long it is, you did the things that gave you the highest return on investment for learning the lessons that you need to learn? Whether because this is the only life you have and you tricked yourself into believing in reincarnation so your heart rate variability would go higher, or because you actually are going to come back in our life. I have no idea, but I'm good either way. Mm. So just in case, I think living to at least 180 is a good plan. It lets me do more of the fun stuff. And when we get down to what's in superhuman, first step to living 180 is not dying. Good call. <laughs> so, uh, it sounds kind of obvious, but a lot of people read that book. Oh, I never thought about it, but let's just play the odds. If you're average, by the way, okay, if you're listening to the show, you're already not average because you're paying attention to health, mm. right? And if you're reading superhuman, you're not average. But if you are average, what's going to kill you is probably heart disease, cancer, or Alzheimer's disease or diabetes. And diabetes turned out as a risk factor for the other three. Mm. So pretty much that's your future. You're gonna be unable to metabolize food until you puff up and die of a sugar overload and other diseases, that's no good. Uh, You're gonna pop a gasket, your heart will stop beating. Um, Or you could just forget your name and your kids' names and end up in diapers. And uh, cancer, we all know, you know, chemical poisoning, radiation poisoning, surgery, and what no one talks about, though, is that your chances of living if you had cancer are twice as high now as they used to be. So we're actually not preventing cancer very well. The incidence is higher, but the survival rate is increasing pretty dramatically, right? So I, I end up looking at all these and saying, okay, what do we do, the basic things to avoid your risk of all of those? Because if you just turn that down, your quality of life is unquestionably going to be higher even if you die at... 87 or whatever the average would be given your demographics. And then once you've 
lowered those risks, you say, all right, what are the things that are going to make me die of some other cause? And maybe one of these. And for those, there's these seven pillars of aging that now scientists understand. We used to think, oh, we don't know why we age. We age because of time. You know, we age because of whatever. But it's not one thing. And it's sort of like, why does your car break? Well, is it because you didn't change the oil? You didn't put gas in the tank? You didn't change the tires? You didn't rotate the timing belt and all the other stuff you do to maintain a car? And did you do it at the right time throughout the life of the car? If you do it right, there's cars with 700,000 miles on them driving today, and there's cars in the junkyard with 70,000 miles. Right. I'd like this to be a 700,000 mile car. It might have a few wrinkles in the <laughs> seats, but it's perfectly serviceable and it gets around under its own power. And this is doable, but only if you know the maintenance schedule. So the seven pillars in Superhuman are about those. For each of the pillars, uh, there's things you can do that are free, that are lifestyle based. There's things you can do that are pretty cheap, like you know, maybe change your diet a little bit or take a supplement uh, or a small gadget, let's say. And then there are things that are based on the very cutting edge science. Some of them are frighteningly expensive, but this is what the millionaires are doing. And I went to the trouble of going out and doing as many of those as I could afford or find. And those things are, are in here. So I'm, here's the experience of doing it. Here's you know, an expert. Here's you know, my own assessment of this. And here's the results I had. And what I want people to walk away from this interview, from reading the book, just from thinking about this, aging is death by a thousand cuts. And these seven pillars are what are holding you up. But what if you took less cuts, they were less deep, and then you healed those cuts like Wolverine <laughs> instead of just putting Band-Aids on them? Mm. You'll find that when you're old, you have a lot less scars, and you function a lot better, and actually, you're not old. You just have lots of years. And mm. that is the path that I'm on, and, and it's an accessible, achievable path for everyone. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you talk about in the book, I was actually um, excited to see that you put it into a nice, simple sentence. And basically, aging boils down to the mitochondria. Yeah. And I've never heard anybody put such a fine point on it before. One, for people that don't know what are mitochondria, and then two, why is aging so related to that? Mitochondria are, we like to say, the power plants of the cells. This is seventh grade biology. It's what you hear on every news show. But uh, I went really deep on the biology of these ancient bacteria that we like to say we harnessed for ourselves, mm -hmm. they're actually running a lot of the decisions in our bodies. They're the ones who run the operating system of life for us. And the operating system of life is run away from, kill or hide from scary things. They decide how much energy goes into fight or flight and how much goes into cellular protein folding. Mm -hmm. They're making the electrons and deciding what to do with them. And they're keenly interested in food because without food, their job is to take food and air and a little bit of light and make energy out of that. And if they don't get enough of those things, they freak out and they change their behaviors and that changes your behaviors. And mitochondria, because the way you're talking about them make them sound like they're a separate entity and they actually do have their own DNA, right? They are separate bacteria that are now inside our cells. They have their own DNA and they share some functions with our DNA. But after this book came out, when I said very straightforward, mitochondria are at the root of aging. And one of the seven pillars is mitochondrial uh, mutation. However, their performance determines how well you live. Then the study came out and what they found was profound. They found that when mitochondria make enough energy, that the energy gets used by your nuclear DNA repair facilities. So if you have enough energy in your cells because you ate the right stuff, because you did the right stuff like sleep and exercise the right way and all the other things that, that I talk about in here, you will have enough energy to repair your human DNA, not your mitochondrial DNA. So if you don't want to get cancer, you don't want to get these mutations over time, you've got to have enough energy to repair. And this is what's happening to a lot of us. I'm going to say a lot of us. 48% of people under age 40 have mitochondrial insufficiency. Everyone over age 40 has mitochondrial insufficiency unless they're managing it. How do you test for that? It just so happens that upgrade labs we have the gold standard test. In fact, we're the only ones who have it. We have exclusive uh, rights to it. And you use a VO2 mask and it actually measures your oxygen consumption and how efficient you are at using it. There are other blood tests and all that are just not that reliable. I've been searching for a mitochondrial sufficiency test for years. The only one that I know is you get on an exercise bike, breathing through a mask with a special algorithm that analyzes what you're doing to see how much energy you make and how much oxygen was left over. There's no lying to that system. Right. 
So the studies show those numbers are accurate. So what that means is as we age, we get worse at using air and food to make electrons, whether it's to ride a bike or to think a thought or to feel an emotion. All of those are driven by the same exact electrons that are powering your phone. And we unfortunately can't plug into a USB cable to recharge yet. That would be a lot easier. That's, that, that's the next book. That would be a lot easier. Um, so if mitochondria are the source of aging, you threw out a couple things really fast that we can do to protect against that or to optimize our mitochondria. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? There's about a quadrillion mitochondria in your body, way more than there are bacteria in your gut and way, way more than there are cells in your body. Mm. So your neurons in your brain have 15,000 mitochondria in one cell. And these things have their own little unique consciousness, cell level consciousness like a bacteria would have, you know, very basic things that they do. But it's become this elegant dance where inside a neuron, these mitochondria will move back and forth and it'll break in half and, and they do stuff that is at the very, very core of life. Stuff we didn't understand 20, 30 years ago because we couldn't see it, we mm. couldn't measure it. And one of the things that they do is they hang around even if they don't work very well. That means that if you don't provide enough stress for them, they will not go to the biologically expensive trouble of killing the weak ones and replacing them with fresh young That's ones. Interesting, I didn't know that. So it's kind of like a cell in your battery, right? You're in your Tesla or even in your phone. There's multiple cells in your battery, and mm -hmm. if one of the cells goes bad, the battery, the phone keeps working, doesn't charge quite as well. Two of the cells go bad. Eventually, enough of the cells go bad, it only holds the charge for five minutes. You're in the hospital. Your phone's right. getting replaced. Well. What if there was a way to say, oh, this cell's going wrong. Let me kick that cell out and grow a fresh new cell. That's what our bodies do. And when you do things like fasting and you just don't eat breakfast, it's not that hard, or don't eat for a couple days. When you do that, all the cells that cannot survive because they're freaking out, I don't mean your cells, I mean the cells within the cells, mm -hmm. the mitochondria, they'll actually die through a process called autophagy. And when that happens, your body cleans out the dead ones and you grow fresh new young ones. But if you never experience hunger because you're living that donut life, then you won't do that. And if you get really cold for a brief period of time, any cell that can't make enough heat to keep you warm, your body says, oh, an ice age might be coming. I better have enough young cells that can make heat and it gets rid of the cells all right, let's get real specific on both of those and then okay. we'll, we'll keep going. But so intermittent fasting, what's your protocol? So Bulletproof Diet 2014, I talked about doing a 16 hour window. It turns out you can, and this has since been backed up by several experts on autophagy, you can have Bulletproof Coffee in the morning. Zero sugar, zero protein is important, zero carbs. So you're only doing fat and coffee or just coffee or tea. A lot of people can't go for 16 hours. I mean, if you're like I was when, when I weighed 300 pounds, the idea of going without eating six or eight meals a day is abhorrent because you know you're gonna die and so, or you're saying, okay, I've got this willpower, I'm gonna do it, and at 11 in, in the morning, you're looking around going, everyone around me is a jerk. Like, I wanna punch all these people. I'm gonna make it to lunch, but why is everyone such a, you know? That's not functional. So a lot of people, they're starting it off with Bulletproof Coffee because they're getting their energy up, mm. right? So I'm gonna put that in the realm of intermittent fasting. I call that one Bulletproof Fasting, shocking, right? Uh, but I'm also very clear. The amount of caffeine in two cups of coffee doubles ketone production, right? So you can have, and that's just caffeine, but uh, coffee itself has other benefits. So you can have two cups, even of decaf if you want to, but calf works better in the morning without any of the bulletproof stuff in it. And you're still going to see a metabolic advantage from doing that. And if you go for 16 or 18 hours of fasting, for me, I skip breakfast and I have a late lunch. It mm -hmm. works really well. The recommendations in here, exercise before the late lunch because exercising in a fasted state increases autophagy, increases stress on the cells, the ones who can't hack it, get out of Dodge, and you grow new ones. And I'll tell you, the data actually shows if you wanna be a circadian, you know, great golden god, you probably should have breakfast and an early lunch and then fast. But you'll have no friends if you do that, so it's not worth it. That's literally how I live my life. So I eat my last meal at 2 p.m. Yep. Um, and you have no friends, it's perfect. I, Literally, Dave, how did you know? Uh, it is. It does make it hard, though. Um, how often do you go days without eating? I would say twice a month I'll go a couple days without eating. And I've experimented. I, I feel really good if I go more than 48 hours. So You say, feel better? Oh, yeah. 
I feel great when I'm fasting and I feel really good when I'm done. And here's the kicker though. If I'm going to go that amount of time and I want to feel really good and be able to write, you know, work out my books and mm. do projects, I'm not going to do working out during a two or three day fast, but I'll not have dinner on Friday. And then on Saturday morning, I'm going to have coffee, but I'm going to put a teaspoon of brain octane in there, which is a very small amount. Different people have all sorts of different debates about, you know, how much of what makes it a fast because mm. the mice only had water. I'm just going to say, look, brain octane specifically doesn't get stored as fat and doesn't get metabolized by the liver. It goes around those things directly into energy. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a teaspoon of it. I get the same results from that as I do if I just drink black coffee, but my hunger levels are like way, mm. way lower. So I, I just feel nothing. I, do are that, there, does brain octane have mm -hmm. uh, calories? It does have calories. Yeah. But different calories do different things, right? Mm, sure. So this is a calorie that doesn't require anything from the liver. And it doesn't require uh, any insulin. In fact, it'll have no effect on your insulin whatsoever. And uh, it doesn't require any protease or any of the protein digestion things. So it pretty much goes in and gets used as energy. Mm. In superhuman, I call it one of the energy fats, where most fats get stored as fat or have to get broken down by the liver to become energy. They become energy of building blocks. This stuff doesn't do that. Yeah, with fast, it's interesting. So the very first time I fast, mm -hmm. I did a three-day fast, yeah. and I had a brutal headache the second night. Oh. And I woke up in the middle of the night, my head is pounding, and I'm like, I don't know if Advil has calories or not, so <laughs> I refuse to take it. Um, you know what would have worked? Activated charcoal. Like I'm, I have never tried that. Oh, it's one of the, in fact, it's the first supplement that, that I made for Bulletproof, and it, it's an ultra-fine one. It helps with headaches? it can help with headaches if they're induced by toxins. And what happened is your gut bacteria were getting really pissed off. They were making extra lipopolysaccharides and you might have been dehydrated. You might have needed magnesium and sodium and potassium. But what's most likely is you are pumping out tons of lipopolysaccharides that are making you feel bad. So anyone who's fasting, I highly recommend take activated charcoal because your body's gonna be dumping toxins. You might as well absorb them in the gut and poop them out instead of putting them into your liver and letting your body recirculate them when the liver doesn't have glucose available for oxidative destruction of toxins. Mm. One of the reasons you get a sugar craving if you eat a food that has toxins in it or even moldy coffee, you get that sugar craving because your liver's like, God, this is a stressor. I need energy right now. It's gonna call on you to, to get that energy. So when you're fasting, absorbing toxins Transformative, there are zero calories, uh, at least digestible calories in charcoal. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I've never tried charcoal. Okay, so now the cold thing. So what's your protocol for cold? How long and how cold? I have a cryotherapy machine at home. We put them in Bulletproof Labs. So three minutes of air that's chilled to 270 degrees below zero. That's cold. Now, Quite official. but that's air. Okay, this is different than a cold shower. A cold shower is like, ugh. Right. Walking outside in shorts during a snowstorm when you're warm is not that big of a deal. And cryotherapy is more like that. Mm. So I'm getting the signal into my body. It's a very strong signal in a very short period of time. You come out, you have like goose pimples, but I'm, I'm not shivering. Most people don't shiver. If they're healthy, they shouldn't shiver. Mm. And I, I also went through a period of ice baths. I have a digitally controlled ice bath that'll hold the temperature constant, circulate the water and freeze your butt off if you want to do that. And there's peripheral cold sensors that are in the skin, which mm. cryotherapy with air does. And then there's stuff from cold showers or ice baths, which are the core temperature receptors and the ones on the skin. And it's arguable which one's better. I know which one takes less time and you get similar <laughs> results from both. So. Um, a mouse research study came out and they show how much cold exposure and how much time is necessary. And it matches exactly what I've seen in humans. So I'm gonna say this one uh, works for humans as well, just because it's the same numbers. Right. What I noticed from myself and others, you take a cold shower the first day, after eight seconds, and by the way, the water hits you in the forehead and the chest. Mm -hmm. After eight seconds, you're like, Dave's a jerk. And you jump out <laughs> of the shower and you're hitting yourself in the head because your head hurts, right? And then you go back in the next day and you're gonna be 20, 30 seconds before you do the same thing. And the third day, you can do a minute and you come out going, I still think Dave's a jerk, but it wasn't that bad. And the fourth day, you get in, like, this feels really good. Well, what changed in three days? Well, the mouse study showed that three days of brief cold exposure changes the levels of cardiolipin in the mitochondrial cell membrane. And cardiolipin? Cardiolipin. And it's one of the things that makes mitochondrial membranes. And all cells, their membrane is what, uh, is what essentially allows some things in, allows some things out. Mm -hmm. In mitochondria, the mitochondrial membrane potential is what makes electrons. So 
what it's doing is it's making the mitochondria work better and they shift the amount of this compound that's in the membrane to allow them to be better at making electricity. And that's why after three days, oh, I can make enough electricity to handle the cold, whereas before I couldn't do it. And that's why that three day period of swearing at, at you for listening to this show is worth it because on the fourth day, like I feel good, but then you burn way more calories throughout the day, you feel better. So is, it's a is minute. it literally making the uh, mitochondria more thermogenic? Like what's, why, That's an interesting question. why would the response to cold be that? The only thing mm-hmm. I can think is, all right, my understanding of the difference between traditional adipose tissue and brown fat is that you have more dense mitochondria, which are able to generate more energy, which thusly creates more heat, and therefore you're able to keep yourself more warm. So that was sort of always, I thought more mitochondria were being formed. I didn't realize there was actually something happening to that mitochondria itself. You, you will see a shift over time to have more brown fat and less white fat as the demand on the body to instantly turn on lots of heat goes up, the body says, okay, let me shape myself to an environment where I'm required to turn on lots of heat quickly. So this is just a a shift to match the environment that that your body thinks it's in, which is one where cold could happen at any time. So the brown fat that mostly is along your upper spine, that uh, that will get stronger and bigger and it has more mitochondria. But the rest of the mitochondria throughout your body will also shift their levels of cardiolipin. So what you're getting is more mitochondria in the form of more brown fat, and you're getting better mitochondria everywhere else. And the mitochondria that cannot make enough heat will get replaced. And that's, I think, the big win. And the amount of time that it takes to do that, I don't know the amount of time that it takes to grow a single new mitochondria. It's probably different for different cells based on nutritional availability, but it's an interesting question. I want to start as nootropics, so Um, my personal obsession is the brain. And you go into, in the book, nootropics, you talk about um, going to Burning Man as one of your action items, which I thought was cool. Walk me through nootropics, how we can use things to enhance our cognition, and not just nootropics, but the sort of host of things that we can do. Uh, this is one of my favorite 20-year passions. Starting in uh, my mid-20s, I said, my brain isn't working the way it's supposed to. I started forgetting things. I was having problems that I didn't like, and my career was just taking off. So I said, what can I do to hack this? I ordered my first big package of smart drugs, and these are mostly pharmaceuticals. They came in, I was all excited, and, and I, I took the first of the bunch I was testing out on myself. It was called Paracetam, and I okay. use an analog of that even today, and I read about that in Game Changers. But the experience was really weird. I took it for a week, and I'm like, damn, I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm so disappointed. This stuff doesn't work. So I stopped taking it. And the next day, I said, you know, I'm grasping for words. And I realized the previous week... Every time I wanted to think of a word, it would just come to me. Mm. And then I found that I'd say, what's the word for that? What was I going to say? And I realized I wasn't having that. But what good nootropics do, the ones that aren't energizing, which is a different effect that's also helpful, they make you feel more like yourself. They reduce the struggle and the work it takes to do something. So it would have been within your skill set, but a struggle or a stretch like, oh, I got that. So like if you could you know, lift a 35 pound dumbbell, but it's work and all of a sudden you'll be like, oh yeah, I got that. Maybe I could do 45. So it's this performance enhancer, but it feels so natural. It feels like yourself that after a very short period of time, you get used to having that superpower and it just mm-hmm. becomes your new normal. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of different racetam family drugs. Mm-hmm. Paracetam has been around for almost 60 years. It's made by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, a big pharmaceutical company in Europe. Well, it's protective of your neurons. It increases oxygen, but not blood flow in the brain. And we're not sure all the ways that it works, but it's got a long safety history. The downsides are it may use more acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. You can eat raw egg yolks or take soy lecithin, or some of the supplements uh, that I make have things that increase acetylcholine in it, and it's widely available at Whole Foods or anywhere. Would you have to eat raw egg yolks to get it? If they're lightly cooked, it's okay. But if you burn your egg yolks, you're not really mm. going to get functional choline. It'll be burned. It's mm. damaged by heat. So you, uh, you, you go through that and say, like, that, that might be one side effect. The other side effect, it amplifies caffeine. So you take one of these things, hold on, your brain works better. It protects your neurons in low oxygen environments, increases oxygen in the brain, and things work better. Like, I think I like this. And what I switch to, and in Game Changers, I kind of give the, the dosage and all this, is one called aniracetam. And aniracetam is lower stress. 
it also is the only one that increases memory I.O. or input output. And I'm a computer science guy. I was a, a computer hacker by training when I weighed 300 pounds. And if you can increase the speed that you put something into a computer's memory or that you get it out, it radically changes the performance of the whole computer. Mm. So faster memory means something. Well, as a human being, if you can find a substance that increases your ability to get things in and out of your memory, when you meditate, you're gonna remember how to meditate better. When you study, you're gonna remember what you do better. When you wanna recall what you did, you're gonna do it better. Mm. I've been on that stuff for 20 years and it's really impactful. Wow. There's also, um, these things that if you increase energy in the brain, you increase performance everywhere. And that's been a big, a big focus. My book before Game Changers was called Headstrong, all about if you increase function of energy producing cells called mitochondria in the brain, mm -hmm. what's it going to do? And it turns out your emotions get better, your ability to regulate your emotions, your ability to recall things, your ability to just have raw power to be you, it goes up. Some nootropics, uh, and a lot of the ones that I focused my, my formulations on, are around increasing energy throughout the body, but most mm. especially in the brain. And then others are around manipulating or modifying things. Another nootropic that's really, uh, really powerful is uh, something that comes from green coffee fruit. Not the coffee beans themselves, but actually the fruit itself. And we produce it, it's called Neuromaster. There's a compound in the brain called BDNF, mm -hmm. brain-derived nootropic factor. And this is nootropic factor, we're talking about nootropics, this is stuff that lets the brain be more plastic, more like a young brain. And it's tied to something called nerve growth factor. Mm -hmm. And if you can find a way to raise those things, your brain will act like a young person's brain, it'll learn faster. So the number one thing that we know that's free that raises both of those is exercise. High intensity interval training, <laughs> lifting heavy things, stuff that you've talked about before on the show, right? But this compound in Neuromaster raises your BDNF levels four times more than exercise. So I'm like, I think I'll exercise and I'll take that stuff. So I want that young plastic brain. And after 20 years of trying pretty much every nootropic out there, I've settled in on what works for my brain. But my advice for you uh, as you go down that path and for everyone watching or listening is your brain is not the same as your spouse, your friend, even your parents, although it's more likely to be like your parents. So the stack that works for me may not be the stack for you. Mm. And this is why when you see companies have like 15 different racetams and all this stuff in there, don't start there. Because one of those may have a negative effect on you and one may have a very positive effect. So try those individually. Mm. Most of the time with supplements, like try all the ones that might work and see if you get the results you want, then pull them out. I found that with nootropics, it doesn't work that way for the pharmaceuticals. With the plant-based ones, it usually does. And I make something called Smart Mode, which is a, a set of very well-studied plant-based compounds for cognitive enhancement. Different, kind of a different universe than the pharmaceutical side. Mm. And it's funny because another nootropic that's controversial and it's in Game Changers is microdosing of LSD. Yes. I interviewed 500 plus people, Nobel Prize winners, all these people, and I said, not what does one person do? And I ask them all the same structured question, but what do they all have in common? Like what are the rules they follow to become game changers? Mm. So that I could boil that down and frankly use it for myself, right? Like instead of doing what that one guy did, I'll do what all of them agreed on. And not all of them microdose LSD. In fact, very few of them do. But the three big buckets that came out of all this research over several years was they do things to be smarter, faster, and happier. Mm. So happiness doesn't come from wealth, but wealth can come from happiness. But being angry and tired and unhappy all the time is not a good way to become successful or to change the game in your field or frankly to become wealthy or powerful or whatever else is important. I also got from the data, not one person who's been a game changer named when I asked three most important things in the world for people who want to perform better. Not one said wealth, power, or fame. They're not seeking that. That is not the target. It is a side effect of them doing what they're here to do. Mm. And I had this dinner in New York. It was profound. My friend Andrew hosted this. And he has this long table, 25 people, and there's hedge fund managers, like, like big people in New York. And it was a Jeffersonian dialogue. And what that means is that instead of just having a random dinner conversation, one person asked a question of the table, and then we discuss it. Mm. 
only one person at a time. So we're all listening and focused. It was really cool. I've never done that before. And when it got to be my turn to ask a question, I said, all right, how many people here have used hallucinogens or psychedelics for personal development? Every single hand at the table went up. Wow. And I'm talking 20-year-old artists to 70-year-old senior executive people. They'd all done it at least once, right? And the rule that came out of that in Game Changers was get outside your head. And there's 46 laws in this book that, that people follow in, in the lines of 48 Laws of Power. And Robert Greene's actually in the book, the guy who wrote 48 Laws of Power. And get outside your head doesn't mean you go do drugs. In fact, if you're under 25, I would say don't go do drugs because mm. your brain's not done cooking. Don't go you know, some, to some random party, even Burning Man. Do it with a trained professional in a place where it's legal. And I talk about you can actually go to a place in Costa Rica that has a medically licensed ayahuasca mm. setting. I did ayahuasca in Peru 20 years ago with a shaman in the jungle, which was a transformative experience for me. But just to go out there and say, hey, yeah, I got someone to go to Disneyland, that is not good for your soul. It is not good for your performance. It's not cognitive enhancing. Mm. But having the ability to look in and see what your mistakes are, you can do this with holotropic breathing which is a, a type of breathing that was developed to replace LSD for psychotherapy in the early 70s. I saw that in the book. Go into detail about yeah. that. Oh, I, I love this. So Tom, in addition to this losing 100 pounds, getting control of my biology, and having a successful career, making my brain work better, when all the stuff that was supposed to work didn't work, I said, right, I'm going to go outside the box. I'm an engineer. So I'm going to try meditation. It's not supposed to work. And 20 years ago, no one meditated. Or if you did, you wouldn't tell your friends because they think you were goofy. And I put it on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to go uh, do a personal development thing. And I was at a point in my life, I was ending a relationship. And a friend said, Dave, you have to go do this. And I said, what is it? She said, I'm not going to tell you. Right, so what? She said, you won't do it if I tell you. So just trust me. All right, fine. I didn't know what else to do. I was feeling kind of desperate. So I went to this personal development retreat. And a part of this was you'd lay down on a mat with a facilitator sort of watching over you. There's a bunch of other people in the room doing the same thing. And they play like movie soundtrack music. And you do this really deep, rapid breathing. And the technical term for what you do is called tripping balls. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's the technical term. Yeah, you're like, what is going on here? And literally, is it because you're essentially hyperventilating? Yeah. Okay. You're hypoxic. But it has, with the music and the set and setting, it has really deep like really deep things that happen. And I have seen more uh, things in there than I have from ayahuasca or from doing you know, ceremonial use of uh, psychedelics. Um, Whoa, in how a, often in do you do this? I do it like maybe once every year or two. Huh. And twice I've done this with Stan Groff, the guy who invented it. He's the guy who created the field of transpersonal psychology. Mm. In the 60s in Czechoslovakia, when it was still one country, he had, from Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, the same company that makes mm. Paracetam, he had a shipment of LSD when it was first invented. Wow. And he, as a licensed psychiatrist, treated 3,000 patients with LSD. Oh. And he noticed that they were all getting better, and he was frustrated that the Freudian stuff wasn't working. So they all get better, but there's patterns about how you come into the world. There's patterns where people get stuck. And he could help them work through it using this. And when, when you say patterns of how you come into the world, are you talking like literal birth? I'm talking about birth. Okay. Yeah. And there's, according to Stan's work, there's five stages of birth. And one is you know, you're floating, you're all happy, and your mom, and you know, there's plenty of space. And then you're like, ah, there's not enough space in here. Like, it's getting tight. And then there's, oh, my God, someone's trying to smash the crap out of me. <laughs> that would be the actual getting born. And then there's the, I just came into the world. And then there's the, you know, your first breath kind of thing. And then there's mm -hmm. the, is it a safe world or is it an unsafe world? And he, he found that repeatedly the people who had this kind of problem had stuff stuck here. And they would actually go back and revisit the emotional symptoms of birth. And based on that, a lot of the pre and perinatal psychology that is groundbreaking work for the, over the last 30 years came from Stan's work with his wife. And when LSD was made illegal, he said, screw that noise. And so he studied uh, yoga and Ayurveda to find a kind of breathing that would produce the same effects. And I can tell you, when you do that breathing with a licensed, you know, practice professional knows what they're doing, you can do personal development that is very hard to do. And it's one of the ways without drugs to get outside of yourself. In my case, what I figured out was I was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. And I didn't have oxygen cut off to my brain. So I was like, 
that's no big deal. Who cares, right? You know, there's like some random thing that happened, like a, a trivia point. Mm. And when I met the woman running this retreat where they did breathing, uh, it was called the Star Foundation. It's still around. And she, she has these like really vibrant blue eyes and she looks at me, she goes, tell me about your birth. And, and I was like, kind of weirded out, like I'm, I'm an engineer. So I, I look at her and I go, uh, hospitals, vaginas, <laughs> uh, you know? And I was kind of like, like, what's up with this? And she, she said, well, do you, really, really, do you know anything? And I said, yeah, I had the cord around that. She goes, I thought so. And she puts up a, a PowerPoint slide. And it's me, like a, a SWOT analysis. They teach you that in business school, like strength, weakness, opportunity. It was like if I was a butterfly pinned down. <laughs> like she nailed all the things I was afraid of that I wouldn't tell anyone. Wow. And I was like, how did, this, how did you know that? And it, it was like an act of wizardry. And she said, well, it's science. We've been studying this for 30 years. And we know that people who have an umbilical cord or you know, really traumatic coming to the world, they come in. And what had happened is I'd come into the world like something's trying to kill me. And so you come into the world ready to kill and you never stop. And I did that for 30 years. Talk about raising your IQ. Stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be a lot smarter, right? Explain that to people. You talk about that quite profoundly in the book. Yeah. What do you mean by if you stop coming at the world like that, that you're actually smarter? Well, you, your body makes electrons. The primary thing that your cells do inside each cell, there's, there's hundreds to thousands or even tens of thousands of these ancient bacteria called mitochondria. And they run a lot of our, our operating system. And their job is to take food and air and make energy. And then the energy goes somewhere. The energy goes to breathing, to walking to willpower, it also goes to thinking, it goes to anxiety, it goes to stress, it goes to hate, it goes to any of the bad things, right? <laughs> so if you're putting, without your permission or knowledge, you're putting your energy into that, you're not putting into thinking, you're not putting into serving your community, you're not putting into your relationships, you're not putting in, into, into love, into kindness, into self-kindness, into recuperation, into recovery, into becoming a better human being. And it is, you have one electron, the same electron that powers your iPhone, and are you going to put it into being a better human being? Are you going to put it into being afraid of something that isn't a threat? Mm. And we're wired to over-respond to threats because all animals, including ones without brains like ours, that's the, that's the operating system for survival. And it starts inside each cell, literally quadrillions of times, or quadrillions of locations in the body, millions of times a second, your body's saying, what's going to kill me now? What's going to kill me now? And it's our job as we become smarter, more intelligent, more effective to actually turn down that voice. And some of the laws and game changers are about, okay, how do you become aware of that? Because awareness is hard. It, the story that you tell yourself about whether something's a threat, you believe it. Mm. When someone cuts you off in traffic, and the story that goes in your head is, that son of a bitch thinks he's more important than me, and you know, I, I should kill him. Now, I used to have like an overdeveloped middle finger muscle from that. But see, that story's all BS, right? That probably came from being bullied in first grade, who knows? But the real story is someone cut in front of you. And they could be on their way to the hospital to go see their dying wife, or they could just be an asshole. <laughs> but you don't know. So I stopped the stress that, that, that I would think from that. I'm like, I'm gonna choose the story. But we're doing this thousands or even tens of thousands of times a day. And if you just shift the needle a little bit by gaining awareness, the end result is not only do you have more time and more electrons to think more effectively, but we're wired to be nice to each other. And when I say wired, I mentioned overreacting to fear, Tom. If you are a single-celled organism, there's a very specific set of rules that everything has to follow. And the first rule is, if something, if you think something's about to kill you, it's a threat, immediately you have to run, you have to kill, or you have to hide. And that's the first F word, it's fear. Because it's game over. Like if you're a bacteria, something eats you, oh, that was okay, lost. So life won't go on without that. Mm -hmm. The second thing you do is eat everything. Because you don't know if there's going to be a famine. If you starve, it's game over. And the third thing, so that, that was feed. So we have fear feed. The third one is also an F word. And it's reproduce the species. <laughs> <laughs> and that explains like why you date all the people you shouldn't date. <laughs> because if you don't reproduce the species, it's game over. So. Our wiring is all about game over. And you can say, well, that sucks because that's the human condition. Mm -hmm. It's actually the condition of life. And without it, none of us would be here because we would do things that would self-destruct. Or I'd say we do them more often. A lot of us self-destruct anyway. 
But there's another F word that comes at the end of that, and it's friend. Even single-celled organisms will work together, they'll cooperate, and they'll form a community that provides uh, greater benefits than you know, being the, the lone wolf mm. kind of thing. And humans are the same way. So this is our order of operations. So our job as, as human beings, your job with the work you're doing on, on spreading information like this, it's like, look, maybe we can have less fear, we can have less hunger, we can have better sex, <laughs> and maybe more beneficial, soulful, uh, you, you know, healthy sex. By the way, there's four laws in Game Changers about sex, including orgasm hangovers and what those do to men. And when you, you get past that, we're actually supposed to be nice to each other. It actually feels good to be supportive and to be nice. And this is built into, our, it built into every cell in our body. And that's why this getting outside your head is so important. And whether you choose to go down that psychedelic route, whether you want to do a shamanic drumming ceremony, you want to fast in a cave, uh, you want to go to Tibet and you know, go to Mount Kailash and do meditation for 10 days, these are all paths that lead to more self-awareness. And along the way, wouldn't it be nice if you weren't hungry the whole time? So maybe you could eat properly, right? <laughs> and if you just do some of these right, you don't have to do them all right. There's huge amounts of untapped energy inside the human body, in, inside us energetically, biochemically, uh, emotionally, spiritually. It's all, it's all in there. And I was only tapping, I don't, I don't know what percent, 5%, 10% when I was in my 20s. And I'm 46. And I have more energy now than I did when I was 25. And I have more energy than a lot of the people who work for me 20 years younger than me. And it, it's all there because I just stopped doing the stuff that wasn't serving me. Mm. So to that point, going back to these 3,000 people treated with LSD, the fact that everyone around the table had experimented with hallucinogens, is it the dissolution of the ego? Is it like, what is it about it that's going uh, to allow you to redistribute that energy, to stop wasting it on stupid shit? Like what, what happens actually? Oh, that is a profound question. So part of my path has been doing neurofeedback. And I've spent four months of my life with electrodes glued to my head, wow. doing intense meditation, looking at brain waves. And I do this with clients. And you can learn some things about the ego. I mentioned that operating system in the body. There are studies, th this is creepy, but it, this, these are real studies that are validated and reproducible, where they'll take a computer screen and they'll have a random number generator inside the computer so no one knows what's gonna come out. And if it's an even number, they show a picture of flowers and puppies. And if it's an odd number, they show a picture of grisly violence, okay. They're hooking the subject of the study up to monitors that look at their, it's called galvanic stress response or skin response. It's a, a measure of stress in the body. And the weird thing is, before the image comes up, before any human being knows what the image is going to be, if it's the grisly image, the body responds before the image. It's crazy. It's creepy. Right? It, it, if that is real, and it is, then there are some things that we don't understand. There's all sorts of theories, and some of them are being borne out, and it probably has something to do with quantum which is the most misused new age buzzword of all hell, but it's also quantum physics, quantum biology. These are real scientific things studied at university. So we, we, essentially there's something going on here where we have a, a, the ability to detect the environment around us before we have conscious awareness of this. So the body responds and then we think about it and then we tell ourselves a story about why we did it, mm. but the order of operations is different. And if, if that sounds weird, Here's something that happens to most of us at some time in our life. You lean on a hot stove and you pull your hand away before you get burned and you say, thank goodness I pulled my hand away. But that is not a true statement because you did not decide to pull your hand away. Something pulled your hand away without your knowledge or permission mm. and you were glad it happened so you decided that it was you who did it, right? Well, what is that? That's the ego. The ego is the operating system that keeps you alive if there's no human in there. So it has its own goals, it has its own agenda, and it is there to keep you alive. Unfortunately, it thinks many things will kill you that won't kill you. And most of its programming happens in age zero through seven. <laughs> That's interesting. So if you were bullied, and even if you had great parents, I promise you that there was one time when your mom stopped nursing you and you got really pissed off. And whatever was happening in the situation, it, it leaves a pattern. And your body is just a pattern matching system. And the egos, they're like, hey, I'm just trying to live. And your ego's also just, it's absolutely convinced that if you're in charge instead of it, you'll die. 
because its job is to keep you alive. And if it's not doing its job, you'll die, right? And because it's an emergent system inside the body, what's happening when you take any of these solutions, when you do any of these practices that get you sort of outside yourself, you gain better self-awareness because you start looking at yourself as this system and you start seeing what your ego is doing. You see how absurd that story is about the guy cutting you off in traffic. Or, so what are some you know, patterns and routines that people can do on a daily basis? Um, you've talked about how only miracles happen in the morning, you've talked mm. about the power of belief. Um, what can anybody watching right now take away and do on a daily uh, basis to make sure that they're optimized for this? Okay. The single biggest way to turn off the ego, the ego is about want, it's about emptiness, it's about what the Tibetans call hungry ghost. So Hungry ghost? Hungry ghost. It's one of the seven realms of hell in Tibetan Buddhism, and it's one where everyone walks around with these distended bellies, and they're always hungry no matter what they eat. They can never be satisfied no matter what they have. And this happens with a lot of people, entrepreneurs. This happened to me when I was 26. Tom, I made $6 million when I was 26 years old at the company that held Google's first servers. I lost it when I was 28. When I, when I had that money, I looked at a friend at the same company where we all made more money than we should have, and I said, I'll be happy when I have $10 million. <laughs> I, I freaking said that, okay? What kind of a jerk move was that? But that was my story, right? That's that hungry ghost syndrome, right? And so what you can do, that's the antidote for that, that's the antidote for all the stress, anxiety, anger, fear, is something I do with my kids every night. And you don't have to have kids to do it. But I sit down and I say, tell me three things you're grateful for today. And gratitude is the final law in Game Changers. Mm -hmm. And what we see in, in 40 Years of Zen in the neuroscience facility, when people are grateful, even for just the shittiest day ever, they're grateful for one little thing. That transforms the biological response in the body from want, from that hungry ghost, from I'm never going to, ha I'm never going to be happy. It transforms it into, whoa, there's something good here, there's some abundance. And what happens right after gratitude, and with, in the neuroscience stuff, we dig deep, we say, okay, that was the gateway, now you've gotta actually do something called forgiveness, <laughs> which is when you permanently change your pattern, mm -hmm. where instead of holding that grudge, whether it's a grudge you chose consciously, because something happened to you when you were 20, or something you chose unconsciously because it happened to you when you were two, it doesn't really matter. You, you forgive that all the way, and what's left is compassion. So now you can walk into a situation that would've just absolutely just you know, tightened your jaw, and you're like, you know what? I'm grateful for this. And you're unflappable. The amount of energy you waste, the amount of struggle you have, it all goes down. And it's simple. Write down three things you're grateful for. And I ask my kids to do this every single night, not to write it down, they just tell me. And sometimes it's like, I'm grateful we had steak. You know, I'm grateful I played with Johnny, whatever. But when my son was five, he goes, I'm grateful for the Big Bang, because without it, there wouldn't be anything. And you're like, whoa, like, like I never would have thought of that one. But these little things, it's free. You just have to find a way to consciously, intentionally be grateful instead of be hungry, empty, pissed off, angry, stressed, feeling not good enough, and all the other stuff. And this is what the people who are game changers, the people who've done really big things, including you. Like, you figured out a lot of the stuff in this book. When people get to a certain level, they, by definition, had to figure out some of these laws because you cannot get there if you're running just the normal mogul programming that we all come into the world with. I was going to say, you put in the book that, um, oh, God, normal is your nemesis? Yeah, normal is the enemy, one of the two. Average right. is the enemy. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So speaking of average being the enemy and things that we can do, one of the concepts that I found really interesting in the book is rewilding yeah. um, and, and your choice to move to an island in Vancouver on an organic farm because you said the greatest gift you could give your kids was growing up in nature. Talk about that. Why is it important? What does it do for us? What's forest bathing? Like all that stuff. Oh, this is so cool. I'm, I'm so happy that you went there. The idea of, of rewilding is that we've been kind of domesticated. When animals are in a zoo, the old zoos were, you know, a, a bar, like bars and a cement cage, and the animals would die all the time. So they finally realized maybe we could make an environment that's at least mostly like nature. So you go to, you know, the San Diego Zoo and there's trees all around and there's the little miniature savanna and all that. Well, we're the same way. So you have plants in your house. You do some sometimes you're cold, sometimes you're warm, sometimes you, you, you you're hungry. Mm. Things that would have happened to us as, as human beings, it, it's really transformative to have some of that. And when you combine that with access to nature, you get this idea of forest bathing, which came from Japan. And just walking around 
in a forest, exposing yourself to trees and clean air does a couple things. One is it's shown to reduce anxiety levels. Just seeing plants does that. But the other thing it does is it changes the microbiome in your gut and your, your lungs and your nose because you're walking through forest bacteria. And our bodies collect these bacteria from the environment around us and be, they become a part of us. Uh, and the idea that we're not bacteria is completely false. There's bacteria inside every cell in your body that power who you are. There's, they become a part of us, so we like to think they're different than those other bacteria, but they're not. So this forest bathing, you get the cognitive effects of seeing the green. A lot of people don't know this, but we can see more shades of green than any other color because we evolved in the forest. And the reason you need that fine ability to see that the shades of green is because that's where the leopards hide. Mm. <laughs> Predators are there. But we're, we're wired to be in that environment. When you do it, your body relaxes. And so just introducing plants, walks in nature, sunshine, and occasional biological stresses. It's cold, it's hot, I'm hungry, I worked really hard, the way animals would have, it transforms your biology. Do you take cold showers? I do, in fact, if you take a cold shower for three days in a row, you only need about 30 seconds, maybe a minute at the end of your shower. So if you do this, it has to hit you on the forehead and the chest. And it's important because the most cold receptors are there. And you're gonna last 10 seconds the first time you do it, and you, it's really unpleasant, and you'll be like shivering. Second day, 20 seconds. Third day, like, you know what, I felt a little, I actually felt kind of good today. And the fourth day, you're like, yes! And there's uh, something in your mitochondrial membrane. And membranes are little layers of fat that surround every cell. And it's called cardiolipin. And a new study just came out that shows three days of cold exposure, even for a few minutes, raises cardiolipin levels, which makes your cells make energy more effectively all day long. Mm. The side benefit of a cold shower is that these ancient bacteria, some of them are in good shape and some of them are not in good shape. When they can't turn on heat quickly, it means they're weak. If you show the body, you will be in an environment where sometimes you need to make heat quickly. The weak ones will die and they'll be replaced by young ones. Mm -hmm. So you want to stay young, you take a cold shower. You don't have to do it every day, but do it every couple days after you get used to it. Mm. All right, so let's talk about staying young. Let's talk about, so my personal fantasy is actually to live forever. What are things that people can do on a daily basis to prime themselves to live as long as humanly possible? I love it. Um, this month, uh, Men's Health ran an article about, I've been really public, I'm gonna to live to at least 180. And at least is an important word there, because like you said, I'm happy with forever. And what you wanna do is look at, at aging as death by a thousand cuts. Mm. It, there's no one cause of aging. It's, we, we think that there's basically seven different things that happen inside your cells and outside your cells that evolve over time. And here's the deal. If it's death by a thousand cuts, maybe you could have only 500 cuts and make them less deep. So when it is not expensive, it's not inconvenient or painful, take the path of less cuts. Mm -hmm. Don't eat fried food. <laughs> Don't eat charred food. <laughs> like th these are very basic things, but the science is pretty solid on that. Don't eat seed oils, things like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, vegetable oil, cottonseed oil. That stuff will make you age, and we understand that. It is abundantly clear. Don't eat too much animal protein and don't eat no animal protein. <laughs> like these are things, eat a lot of vegetables. Uh, don't eat stuff that's been sprayed with glyphosate because it messes with the way your body makes collagen protein and it messes with your gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. And uh, things, things like that, those are gonna go a huge way. Sleep adequately, right? I sleep about six hours and five minutes a night. Do you set an alarm? Uh, I do. Uh, if, I, if I have a, a busy day, which I quite often do. However, I often wake up before the alarm, and the alarm is set to wake me up at the top of a sleep cycle, so I never wake up when I'm groggy. So you can do that, or you can just make sure you get enough sleep, or you have enough deep sleep, which is anti-aging, and enough REM sleep, which consolidates your memories. And if you do that, you're gonna live a lot longer. Oh, and don't eat too much. If you eat a lot of calories, more, more than your body needs, that's aging. Intermittent fasting, which I, I helped to popularize in 2014 with the Bulletproof Diet, that is a big thing, it works. Occasional longer fasting. None of these is expensive, and I take 150 supplements a day. Whoa! All right, we can't list all 150, but give mm -hmm. me some of the all-stars. Right. So I focus on mitochondrial enhancement. So I take a kind of uh, fish oil that comes from not just krill, but it comes from fish eggs. And fish eggs are an even richer source of phospholipids 
And uh, so that's something that Bulletproof manufactures. It's our omega-3 krill. And I think that's really important because getting omega-3s into the brain is the most important thing you can do. I take supplements that control inflammation because my body still tends to, because I had autoimmunity for a long time, it tends to have more, um, it tends to have more inflammation. So we make a turmeric that has some Chinese herbs in it that really work uh, for the kind of inflammation that I have. I'm like, oh, I feel much better. Uh, I take uh, a bunch of other unusual mitochondrial enhancers that we make. One's called Unfair Advantage. Another one's called Keto Prime. And that actually primes the mitochondrial pump to be able to use sugar or fat to make more energy. So I used to open 10 bottles, take 10 pills. Now I open one bottle, and it's just less work. So a lot of this has been consolidation mm. over time in order to do it. So when I travel, I have three bags, like little crack bags full of pills. And I take one when I wake up. I take one with food or coffee in the morning, one at lunch, and one before I go to bed. And you know what? My life is way better when I do it. It's annoying, and it's not cheap, but I'm going to extend my life. And even if I completely die trying, I've extended the quality of my life energy all along the way. You cannot lose with that strategy. Mm. Talk to me about vitamin D. You've said that sun exposure is not optional. And I'm, I'm trying to imagine you in Vancouver in, say, February, <laughs> getting sun every day. Um, do you really go outside in the sun it, every day in Vancouver? It sucked to move up to the Pacific Northwest. I've been up there for eight years. I grew up in a desert in New Mexico. Mm. So uh, I'm a desert person. What I do in the winter, and I, it took me about three winters to figure this out, is I take vitamin D. And taking vitamin D is important. As a supplement. As a supplement. And we make one. In fact, this is important. This is the one I take. It's, it's called ADK because you need vitamin A and vitamin D together. And if you take vitamin D without vitamin K, and I mean K2, not K1, when you take those together, vitamin K basically keeps the calcium in the cells and vitamin D encourages calcium to go into the cells. If you take the vitamin D without vitamin K, it can encourage calcification throughout the body, which is not what you want. Mm. That's a bad thing. So um, that, uh, that works really well. But for vitamin D to work, it has to be activated through a process called sulfation. And that's what happens with ultraviolet light exposure. So in Vancouver, what do I do? In the morning, I stand on my vibrating platform. Yes, Bulletproof makes that. It's called the Bulletproof Vibe. I stand on that, and I have a sun tanning lamp that's optimized for high UVB. It helps your vitamin D, and it even helps with collagen formation. Where do you get the machines? I know Mercola was making one for a while that was UVB optimized. Yep. I have Mercola's old machine. Okay. And what happened there is um, it was very unpopular to, to say that... Um, that UVB light had any health impacts. And it's bad for you in high doses. Let's be really clear. Like you can get cancer for too much UVB. Right. But if you do a search for high UVB tanning lamps, they sell them on Amazon. They have little mm -hmm. boxes that do it. And just don't overuse it. This is not about getting dark. This is about getting an effective dose of something that's going to biotransform the vitamin D hormone. It's a hormone, not really a vitamin, mm -hmm. in the body so that it becomes active. And that can reduce your risk, just having active vitamin D of all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, that's what I do. Right? And I, I feel good about that, and I think the science is solid on that. What are a few key things that people can do for their diet if they want to live forever? All right. I wrote two books that are sort of diet-focused. One of them is Headstrong, but the big diet book is The Bulletproof Diet. And here's the gist of it. It is cyclical ketosis. If you do the, the, the keto bro diet, as I'm going to call it, right, which is you never eat a carb again, I don't think that's going to work for you. If you eat lots of carbs, that's not going to work for you. So you should absolutely do keto. And then you should stop. Then you should do keto. And then you should stop. And this is for your gut bacteria. And this is for the glial cells in your brain that prefer glucose to ketones. Right? And so I, I feel like, like if you go to the, oh, I'm going to be, like I used to be a, a raw vegan, you know, that's not going to end well for you. I'll just tell you. <laughs> really? You didn't was, uh, enjoy the experience? Well, I mean, I felt great for the first two, three months, like most people do, because you're eating a lot less of the other crap. But it's what happens over time, even mm. if you're pretty knowledgeable. Very few people, in fact, none of the anti-aging people I know support that kind of thing, because mm. they see it in patients. The CrossFit coaches, like, yeah, I can spot a vegan or raw vegan. I ask them to hold on to a bar, and they drop off after five seconds. And people who eat french fries can hold on for 15 <laughs> seconds. And people who eat grass-fed steak and you know, do keto and you know, are doing things right, they hold on for 30 seconds. Like, mm. like it, it's quantifiable, right? So this isn't a rip on vegans. I was a vegan for a long time. I would eat gravel if it's what was best for me or best for the planet. I'll tell you, eating grass-fed meat that restores soils 
um, is best for you and best for the planet, but not too much. Mm. And that plus a huge plate of vegetables with lots of undamaged quality fats following the ratio in your cells. Your cells are 45% saturated fat, your cell membranes, especially in the brain, it's a little bit higher. They're in the brain about 30, 35% monounsaturated fat. And then the rest of it is all about the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. Mm. And there you want more omega-3 and less omega-6. So tons of veggies, moderate amount of high quality grass-fed protein, tons of fat. From protein perspective, um, you wanna get high quality protein and plant compounds, polyphenols, terribly important. You're not gonna get them from colored fruits and vegetables, they're just not rich enough. Herbs and spices are how you get it. And number one source of polyphenols in the world, you probably know what it is. Mm. Oh, coffee. Coffee, <laughs> I do know that because you talked about it in the book. I was You're like, right. so coffee, tea, chocolate, and I'm sad to say this, even though we all like red wine, it doesn't have very many polyphenols and you gotta detox the alcohol mm. and the aldehyde. So you can have some wine, but make sure it's good quality wine. Uh, I would say wine and, and grass-fed meat, it's like, spend money on quality and consume less, and you don't have to consume none. Mm. And, and that algorithm, it's like, it's quality over quantity. When you do that, it sends a signal to the whole food production system about what's acceptable. And you know this because you've run a very impactful, sizable company, right? If the customers are saying they want something and they won't buy the wrong mm. stuff, well, then the company's making the garbage food, they lose sales, and the company's making the really good things right, they gain sales. Yeah. So all of us, when we say, I want the animal that was fed grass instead of fed corn and soy and antibiotics, I'm willing to pay a little bit more even if I buy a little bit less, so it's the same dollars out of my pocket, you'll change our soil, you'll change our agricultural systems. I, I, I firmly believe that, both for my own biology and for the world that we're gonna live forever in, I don't wanna mess it up, right? I, I don't, what, you know a lot about this stuff, Tom. What, what do you think about nutrition? Dude, we will bring you back for part two because okay. I haven't even gotten to a, like one fifth of the things oh, that I wanted to talk sorry, to you about. Sorry, I've been talking too much. But no, this has been amazing. <laughs> it's exactly what I wanted. Before I ask my last question, tell these guys where they can find you online. Go to bulletproof.com and check out Bulletproof Radio on iTunes, wherever podcasts are distributed. And Game Changers is in stores now. If you read it and you like it, leave a review. I actually see those reviews, and you do too, when, yeah, when people tell you any of your work, it matters. We care, like the reviews you get on the show, they matter. You can thank both of us, uh, and there you got your gratitude checkbox for the day. Nice, I like that. Um, my final question, what's one change that people could make that would have the biggest impact on their health? Wow, just one change with the single biggest impact. All right, can I answer with two things? Sure. All right, number one, learn how to sleep like a boss, okay? There's a bunch of new sleep hacks and game changers. Do whatever it takes to sleep really well, and you're gonna have to black out your room. You're gonna have to like, just learn how to do it. No one teaches us how to sleep, mm. okay? And most of that stuff is free or very inexpensive or one-time cost. Um, the second thing is, you gotta stop eating the things that make you weak, and you know what those are. And there's one category of foods that are pretty much bad for everyone. Seed oils, deep fried stuff, charred things, and whole grains. Those are just not good for anyone, right? And you may tolerate whole grains better than your friend, they're still not good for you, sorry. Okay, so get those out. And in the Bulletproof Diet, there's a layer of suspect foods. They're bad for some people and good for some people. And you need to know which of the suspect foods are guilty for you. Mm -hmm. And there's an infographic, just Google Bulletproof Roadmap, and you can download it, it's a free thing. It's basically the entire Bulletproof Diet book without all the explanations, just here's what to do now, here's what foods are really good, the bulletproof foods, these are suspect, and these are kryptonite foods. Mm -hmm. Just so you can, all right, if I'm gonna do a protein or whatever, that, that totally works. If you look at those 200 foods that I put down in my book, you could be diseased. Take a Sharpie out and circle the ones that you love already. I like this, I like that one, tomatoes I like, oh man, I like this one. Okay, that's a great starting point because if you start eating those foods, you're already head of the game because you already love foods that can actually eat to, that can activate your health defenses.